Are we recording? Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, and I'd like to declare the Monitoring and Operations Committee for March 2021 open. Uh, can I just start with making a Chair's statement, please? Um, I remind councillors that the public section of this meeting has been recorded and will be made available on the Public Bay of Plenty Regional Council YouTube channel following the meeting and archive for a period of three years. To those members of the public here today, welcome along. All care will be taken to maintain your privacy. However, as a visitor in the public gallery, your presence may be recorded. By remaining in the public gallery, it is understood your consent is given if your image is inadvertently broadcast. Also, I remind all those present that local government decision-making affords no protection to councillors, council officers and the public for comments made during the meeting and are subs subsequently challenged in a court of law and determined to be slanderous. On those statement, can I call for apologies? I have apologies from Chairman Leader, Council Von Dadelson, Thompson and Rose may be late. Any other apologies? Would somebody like to move apologies be accepted, please? Yeah. Councillor Thurston, second and Marty Moana. All those in favour, please say aye. Against carried, public forum, there is none. Items not on the agenda. I believe all the items are on the agenda for discussion today. The order of business is as is in the agenda. Are there any declarations of conflict of interest, please? None. Thank you. Uh, publicly excluded business to be transferred into the open. There is none, I believe. And move straight into the minutes. Oh, I'd like to welcome Shari, our new minute secretary for monitoring operations too. Should change in the, changing of the guard, but welcome along to Shari. Minutes of the meeting held on the 15th of December 2020. Um, would somebody like to move the minutes be a true and correct record? Councillor Crosby, seconded by Councillor Love. Any discussion? I'll put that resolution that the minutes be received. All those in favour, please say aye. Against carried. Thank you very much. Uh, the preliminary stuff is over. Can I welcome for our first of our three presentations this morning uh, from Balance Agri Nutrients, we've got Charlie Bourne, Dominic Adams and Shane DeFour. Welcome along, gentlemen, if you'd like to come up to the presenter's table. So this presentation is um, from Balance. It's, uh, and thank you for your site visit that we had uh, last year, six months ago probably now, but uh, it was a pleasure to walk around your uh, premises and we welcome your presentation. The floor is yours. Just press the button there. Perfect. Uh, morning. My name is Charlie Bourne. I am the operations manager for the Mount site. Uh, there's a lot of familiar faces that I know came on our tour uh, late last year. So um, what we'll do is just give you an overview today as to where we are in terms of air quality and dust and uh, just the efforts that we're making on site. Just an update for what we've done last time we talked. Want to introduce yourself? Yep, sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, my name is Dominic Adams. I'm the environmental manager for Balance. I'm the, the national manager. Um, so I'm not just focused at this site. I'm focused at uh, all our sites around the network. But um, because of uh, previous issues that we've had with dust, I take a very keen interest in this. And me and Charlie spend a lot of time together yeah. um, discussing uh, and uh, working out uh, solutions. And look, I'm Shane DeFore. Thank you, Chair. Um, I am the General Manager of um, Operations and Supply Chain for, for Balance. So I'm here representing the lead team as well in this very, very important part of our business. So I'll hand you over to Charlie. There we are. Let me just go back one. So uh, just who we are at Bound Ops. So... Uh, we've occupied sites since 1958, uh, and in that time, we've been manufacturing superphosphate fertilizer uh, the whole time. Uh, we also have an acid plant on site um, that uh, helps in that manufacturing process. We're roughly 100 people on site in the manufacturing site and 200 people in the uh, corporate office that is also located at 161 Hewlett's Road. Um, 
Yeah, we've got a multi generational workforce. So we've got uh, we've got fathers and sons. Uh, probably about uh, we actually have six father son combinations on site that have been there, and some are third generation that have actually come through uh, for balance. So we've got quite a long tenure uh, with quite a few of our employees. So what we do uh, in the manufacturing of superphosphate, uh, some of you are familiar, it's, it's like making a cake. We, we take sulfur, which is a waste product that comes out of Marsden Point. Uh, it comes out of the refinery, refinery process. Um, at Marsden Point, that would normally go into landfill. What we do is we take that, melt that down to make sulfuric acid, which is necessary in the, uh, to release the phosphate from the, from the rock. In doing so, it's, it's an exothermic reaction that we have. So throughout the uh, acidulation of the rock and through the melting of the sulfur, we produce a tremendous amount of heat on site up to 1,100 degrees. And what we do with that heat is we cool that with water. And as a result, we drive a turbine, which produces, well, actually we produce roughly 850,000 kilowatt hours. Um, after our power needs on site, we put... Um, we expel, or not expel, we, we feed the grid with roughly enough power for 1,500 to 2,000 homes uh, in the mount. So what we do is, um, and what, when we get into the, the, the rock manufacturing, we bring in raw materials from throughout the world. Uh, and uh, so, sorry about that, one sec, yep. So we bring them in throughout the world. Uh, we grind them into a fine talc, and then what we do is we impregnate that with the sulfuric acid that we have. For the next. So in doing so, uh, it's a repeatable process. And in that we've, we've got standard work and processes in place and procedures in place in order to ensure that we have a consistent manufacturing process throughout. Uh, with that, we've got the balanced production system, which is the balances, leash, balances version of lean. And, and lean manufacturing is about eliminating waste in your process uh, it's about putting people first and ensuring that we do the best for our site, for the people we have on site, and for the community that, we, that we're in. Annually, we spend between 8 and $10 million on CapEx uh, for site improvements. Much of that this year is going into mitigation of dust and to ensure that we can eliminate and or control the fugitive dust that we have on site. In the past, we've spent roughly... Um, well, we had about an $8.5 million investment in terms of SOD reductions uh, in 2018. And every year we spend 120 on the monitoring, similar to what we have for water care. But we also um, have a significant investment in terms of people and just active management on site for what we have in terms of uh, closed door policies. Uh, we will suspend production and or activities on site if if it appears that we may have a potential breach for a 24 hour average. So it's, it's comprehensive um, in terms of how we manage it. Um, and with BPS, we, we ensure that we have that active leadership. And as you can see, active leadership, standard work and our asset care to make sure that we have the best available equipment that's running optimum at the optimum, uh, op well, optimized for the process to ensure that we can mitigate our impact on the environment around us. Um, I'll just, uh, just speak a bit now. Um, uh, the, what was on the other slide was also just mentioned the fact that our site is uh, accredited to ISO 14001 for our environmental management system. So we've got a, a management system there that every year we get audited um, to, to make sure essentially that we're doing what we do. Uh, we're doing what we say we do. Um, and that's been uh, it's been a very successful way of ensuring that we uh, maintain our, our compliance uh, and maintain our systems so that we uh, keep our checks uh, on what we're uh, carrying out. Um, so we've got a variety of resource consents um, uh, for the site, uh, discharges to air relating to the acid plant, acidulation, our burnt lime storage uh, and dust and odour. Uh, as well as stormwater, wastewater, and ground soakage. Uh, incidentally, that, that picture there is taken on top of um, our uh, one of our emission stacks, 
uh, where uh, every month our lab team climb up the tower uh, and sit for about two hours doing real-time monitoring uh, as, a, as a part of our compliance to ensure that what our, uh, what our uh, systems are set up to do to, to, to limit our emissions are actually doing them. Um, so long-term trains. Uh, now, if uh, everyone that has been to our that came to our site in December will have seen this graph. Uh, so I won't dwell on it for a long time. But basically, this graph uh, shows, as an example of the improvements that we've made, um, the reduction in SO2 emissions. Uh, now, the um, the initial reduction took place after we had been. Um, uh, it was found that we had been exceeding our, our um, uh, consent requirements uh, and uh, we were uh, prosecuted at that time. Um, so the first thing we did is we reduced our plant make, um, uh, which had a significant reduction of our emissions. We brought in new technology uh, via a, a new catalyst, um, which cost us uh, just over half a million dollars. Uh, and then we were able to bring up our plant make again um, back up to um, uh, 600 uh, tonnes per day. And then we also put in a new uh, converter, uh, which was a further $8 million uh, spend that uh, Charlie referred to a minute ago, um, uh, which made us again be able to ramp up our production a little further without, as you can see, having an impact on uh, our, our air emissions. And uh, what we've currently done is we've put in a request to lower our, um, uh, our current consent limit. It's currently sitting there uh, as the, the top line shows there at 90 um, uh, kilograms of SO2 per hour. And we've uh, elected to reduce it down to 40 um, because we produce uh, below that level. Uh, now, so we carry out air, monitor, air quality monitoring at the site. Uh, we've had dust tubes in place since 1999. Uh, these are the yellow dots that you can see on that graph, on that picture. Uh, and they are basically, um, uh, essentially, they're, they're like elongated buckets that, are, that sit uh, elevated around our, our boundary and over at the Marae. Um, which allow dust in the air to, that, that falls to, to settle and be captured without wind blowing it away. And every month we take those down, take the dust out of the sample pots and we analyse it to see uh, what it contains. Um, what we've been able to identify from that is that of all the dust that we get from these monitors, uh, that's the, the graph at the, or the little table at the bottom there, um, there's, it's typically between 16 and 32% uh, percent of it is fertiliser dust and the rest is dust from other activities that are not on our site. Um, so we're just that helps us recognise that there is more dust than just ours floating around. And as you can see at the Marae, there's 14% of the dust that we get there is typically um, from fertilizer from from us. Um, uh, because of the ongoing issues of dust and uh, and concerns about it um, in the Mount area um, in 2019, um, we uh, put together we brought on site three PM10 monitors. Now, these are BAM monitors, uh, beta attenuation monitors, uh, which are the same as the regional councils. Um, so we, and we placed them around our site. These are the blue dots, which is a little difficult to see on that picture. Um, but basically, we have one in the north of our site on top of our corporate building. Uh, we have one at our, the south, southern boundary fence. And then we have one at our air quality monitoring station, which is based at the Marae. Uh, that mm -hmm. air quality monitoring station also uh, records um, uh, sulfur dioxide and uh, 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 for, for, for that area as well. Um, so these monitors, uh, we, we placed them on, uh, uh, put them in place in June, August, uh, between June and August of 2019, and they've been running ever since. And uh, they give us uh, updates, uh, SMS uh, alerts, if we have any that exceed, uh, that are showing spikes going on, that, uh, that suggest that we may be exceeding our, our limits. Um, what they have shown us uh, to date, uh, has been uh, fantastic to understand. So our southern monitor there, that which is the green graph at the top, 
that shows that there are, are, have been a few exceedances um, at times. Um, at the northern side, it shows that there are a number of exceedances. And what we have found is that quite often our monitor goes off and we get our SMS alerts uh, when we have a north wind. Uh, so it shows that, uh, that material is coming into our site from elsewhere. Um, but it also helps us uh, just keep track of anything that's happening on our site, say if we're getting a rock delivery or if it's a particularly windy day and uh, we're in, in a busy season, it can help us identify, hang on, there's an issue here, we need to lock everything down uh, and improve things. Um, so for the we, over a year, we got some really good data and what that taught us was actually where our problems were. Uh, we had an idea before we had put together a, a heat map of where we assumed we had dust issues and where the dust was coming from. Um, through the monitoring, we were then able to determine what was going on when we were having those exceedances and those high levels. And from that, be able to determine what we needed to change on our site. So some of that uh, included procedural changes in terms of how we do things, and that included um, uh, reducing the amount of blowdowns that we do, uh, which is basically a, someone with a, 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 an air hose and a lance blowing uh, things clean. Uh, and we're moving to uh, vacuuming instead, which is a much better way to, to capture the dust without making it further airborne. We also have a, a truck that goes around our site uh, on a regular basis uh, and goes through our, uh, all our dusty areas to make sure that we're um, picking up dust that's on our, our roadways to, to, to reduce that uh, impact. Um, on top of that, Charlie, during the lockdown, uh, managed to source some vacuum units, some big, huge, beefy machines. And we did a trial uh, at our uh, intakes uh, for some, some rock deliveries to uh, try and um, capture uh, the, the any dust, any future TIF emissions that were coming from uh, from those at that point. Oh, you've just skipped along, uh, but that's all right. Thank you. you. See them there. Yeah. So yeah, in this picture here, in the bottom picture, that's them set up at our intakes. Uh, so basically, we had two units either side of the intake, and then pipes either side with uh, holes in them. And the air was being pulled through the pipes, and that was uh, aimed to try and uh, limit uh, any dust kind of uh, coming off uh, from that area when trucks were, were bought and dumping into the intake. All right, I'll let you carry yeah. on. Uh, yeah, and to, and to follow on from Dom, the, uh, the, the the data was invaluable in, in helping us determine where we needed to focus our time and attention and in, in activities. Uh, up until that point, a lot of it had been... Uh, I think I feel, or I can see it, and what we thought were some of our hotspots actually weren't uh, weren't contributors as much as other activities on site, and so there, therefore we've been able to really target. And the intakes is is a prime example when we have when we take in a delivery, we wouldn't normally see much captured on our we wouldn't normally see much dust airborne dust, but our monitors would capture quite often. So. Uh, what we've done is, is is really targeted. And in that top picture you'll see in here, one of the activities and major capital investments we have underway right now is in closing the end of that dispatch uh, where we load out the fertilizer. <clears throat> Given certain times of the year, we'll get a north, uh, north-south wind or south-to-north wind, uh, depending on which direction it travels. But when it swings around, we get a tunneling effect that comes straight through and directly at the back of that that door there is we've got our air monitor approximately 30 meters behind that's the hedge and then the marae beyond there and so uh to ensure that we don't we don't have issues with dust and we don't we don't uh, contribute more than we should we've to close that in we'll have interlocks between the doors so we won't get that tunneling so if the front door at the front's open the back will always remain closed and vice versa um, also, we've we've ordered in uh, fast acting doors. I'll just go back through the, the activities that we have. We've got fast acting doors for the majority of our doors now on our sheds. They're on order. Uh, they're on a boat that should be arriving end of this month, uh, start of April. It varies a little bit. Um, and before June of this year, we intend to have the eight remaining, there are the eight additional doors that we've ordered in installed at that time. Um, 
uh, we've talked to the main Weybridge and the dust extraction for the rock intakes. Uh, we've tried the vacuum units. We know we have to play with those a little bit to, to make them more effective. We're also looking at possibly enclosing the rock intakes in so we can capture it all within. Um, so we'll enclose it for truck trailer. Um, um, just to, just to try and maintain the environment that we have. So we don't have that airborne dust as well. Uh, and talking there, the equipment repairs, uh, again, from the data that we had, we didn't think we had issues in certain areas when we when we did. Um, and we focused on some of our, our infrastructure on site, uh, specifically our mills. And from there, we gained a significant operational efficiency, but at the same time, we reduced the amount of dust that we were actually creating within the building uh, that had the potential to escape. So it was a it was a win win. Um, in that space as well. And again, all based on the data that we have. Um, and again, to talk to this, the picture to the right will demonstrate what we'll look like, um, uh, what that intake will look like when we're completed. And we've had some issues getting just certain consents through, but um, we should have that. Well, that's all been resolved now. So we plan to have that completed by the end of May uh, this year, possibly July at the very, very latest. Um, and then finally, um, on site, if we can bring in here, what we've done is we've got a significant drive right now just for pride in sight. Um, you know, if you're willing to bring your family to work to show them what you do and how you do, how you do what you do every day, there's that pride. You don't want to take someone in if it's, if it's, if it's a hole, really, what you want to do is you want to, you want to show, um, show your family, take pride in what you do, take pride in the site that you have. And we've, we've turned that corner in the last year and so much so that we had our, our family day, open family day before Christmas time this year, that was, uh, extremely well attended. Um, and the feedback that we had, I think it was shortly after your visit, the feedback that we had at that time was, was outstanding. And from there, we've, we've learned what we could do to make the tours a little bit better, uh, how we can improve that. And we want to open ourselves up now to our industrial neighbors to bring them through to see what we're doing and how we're doing it. And uh, a little later this year, we want to open it up to the public as well and have public days similar to what I know the port used to do in the past. And so we will invite the public to come through site to see what we do and dispel any of the myths that may be out there and answer any of the questions and help educate where we can. That is us. Thank you. Um, Shane, did you want to add to the flavour of the meeting? Uh, yeah, look, look, I'm, you know, I'm very grateful to the councillors that, that I see here that, that attended. Um, look, our, our values as a company are honesty, bravery, um, innovation and connection. So we hope that we can you know, bring that to bear with the rest of the community. We, we're really facing into those brave conversations. We're understanding our issues and we're facing those things head on. Um, we believe that we're a vital part of the economy, providing jobs. Um, we're part of a community um, that's grown around us, um, and, and we're really striving to do that. We believe that what we're doing in terms of the fertiliser enabling New Zealand's economy is is critical. Um, but at the same time, we realise to be a part of a community, then we need to take on um, their views, their expectations, and, and I think we're facing into that. So, yeah, well done, guys. Thank you. Thank you. And um, just before you go, are there any questions from councillors and um, Charlie? That's a really good litmus test, isn't it? But if you're prepared to take your children to your workplace and know that they're safe and healthy and, um, you know, it's a safe environment to work in, that's a really good litmus test, I think. So well done for that. Any questions from councillors? Uh, Councillor Love, Thurston and Titaru? Firstly, Councillor Love. Yeah, thank you. It's just a comment, really, rather than a question. I'm delighted to see the steps you're taking to improve the dust. And I just want to recognise how important uh, you, your business is, both to the economy of Tauranga and to that of New Zealand. Ah, Councillor Love, thank you. Uh, Councillor Thurston. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman, and thank you. Thank you for being here today. I know it's an ultra-sensitive issue here in this community, and uh, so feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in one of your presentations you said 16 to 30% of the fertiliser dust uh, that emanates is from your operation. So if that is correct, 
uh, through Sarah to Shane and to our science team, what is the other balance? Just remind us, please, as a committee, what's the balance of the other 70% of dust particulates at Mount Monganui? Through the chair, uh, it, it will vary depending on the wind direction, but most activities in the industrial area do produce dust. We know that um, there's a lot of unsealed sites in the vicinity and around the balance site. Um, when trucks are moving through there, that causes uh, a big problem. We know that there is a significant amount of traffic dust being generated from Hewlett's Road and Tortoda Street uh, and um, the other the sites in the general vicinity. Um, Salt, can be dusty. Salt spray is a big one too. So yeah, can I add there through the chair that um, sodium chloride, so salt dust and silica, which is sand, is a significant portion of what we're seeing come over our sites, and we're happy to share that if we need to. Councillor White, and then Councillor Knees. Um, Kia ora. Thank you for your presentation. Um, sadly, I wasn't able to get to the site, so I may be repeating questions that you've already answered on site. Um, I'm interested in the, the orientation you showed in slide number seven, I think the air quality monitoring. You showed a site you know, which actually put out the places that have been, areas that have been monitored. I just wanted to get an orientation on that particular, because northeast, you've you got a 32% um, fertilizer dust or total dust. So that, that obviously stands out. So I was just trying to orientate myself on your plan and where, where is, how was, um, I guess for me that's just a standout number, and 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 what is the the counter to that direction of of, of dust travel, if you like? Um, yeah, no, that's a, a good question. Um, the the issue I think uh, with that, so the, the the northeast one there is the um, uh, is the one that sort of sits between that between one? us, yeah, to the tank farm. yeah, between us and the tank farm. Um, that. Uh, to, to be honest, is opposite our um, our rock intakes. So when we have a rock delivery, um, uh, there there can be some dust that will come from there, uh, and they will it will pass over in that direction if the wind is blowing uh, towards the east. Um, our um, I've I've been on site and, and been watching um, uh, rock deliveries, and it's something that we do quite carefully uh, to make sure uh, that we don't have an impact. Um, if we have a, uh, a wind blowing from the north, uh, we will typically um, uh, halt delivery uh, and do additional monitoring to make sure that, because our key concern is that we don't have dust that is blown down towards the Marae. Um, uh, we don't really want dust leaving our site, um, but I think that's where that comes from because it's closest to the, the, the rock intakes. We're not always having rock delivered to our site, but when we do, say if we have a ship come in, we had a ship come in uh, a couple of weekends ago, and so we have a lot of, uh, of trucks coming over the road from the port uh, and delivering to the site. It's also, that's also the exit to the site, uh, so there's uh, the potential for um, uh, some dust to be coming off uh, some of the trucks before they uh, before they wash off and leave the site. Because hmm. we also have a, a, a truck wash that's essentially between it's the intakes. Yeah, between the intakes and that, that monitor. And so and they wash down the trucks at that point uh, before they go out onto the road. So if while they've been in the way bridges, mm -hmm. if there's any um, dust that has gone on their tailgate, et cetera, and the rest of the truck, then that's washed yeah, off. That that one there. And oh, yeah. directly adjacent, yeah, I just realized that. Uh, directly adjacent to that, we have our, the truck washes right here. And uh, as a requirement, they're required to wash down. So NZTA, uh, there's no dust as they travel down the road. Um, and also the dispatch lanes that we're closing in is right here. So if we have a predominantly westerly wind, which, which is the predominant wind, and we get a slight southwest, the buildings will actually, the size of our buildings will actually change some of that airflow and we will get uh, movement wind direction up in here. Uh, the air monitors here and here have actually shown, um, and we have a weather station that's situated on our acid plant stack so that's right there. That lets us know wind speed, wind direction, um, and we monitor and record that 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we can go back historically and look at uh, the activities on site, what was happening and, and, and where it was happening. 
And so when that one picks up, um, when we, you know, now these, these are for, uh, suspended solids so that these more than bigger than PM 10, it's just what settles on the ground uh, for the dust. Yeah. So it's, it, the data has been incredibly helpful to, to actually target our activities. Just a follow-up question then, when you have a northeasterly, do you pay additional attention to that yes. moment? Yes. So uh, last week we had, uh, last week, two weeks ago, the days all kind of blend, um, we we had a northeasterly come through site. And so we had activity taking place at this area of the plant uh, for a loadout. We suspended that for the remainder of the afternoon and we enter into this, these buildings. We have an entry point at the backside here. We also suspended those activities for the remainder of the day uh, to ensure that we don't. Um, and that's the early warning that we get from the on-site monitors. We're able to see what activities we do. So, so I can just add Councillor White on that one, is that the Marae is very much in our, in our site and certainly our relationship with them is, is, is it ongoing and, and we, you know, but we own it. And so I think as a company, we, we're happy to present to you what we own, and what we're doing. I think what we want to do, um, certainly through lead team and through people like Charlie and Donovic, is to prove to the rest of the community that, that, that you can do something about this. And we're not blinkered. We're completely open and honest. Um, again, I'd like to, to you, Councillor White, who didn't uh, come around the site, well, then we extend uh, the invitation at any time. Yep. Um, but we own this. We, we really get it. We are making big inroads into improvement, and I think that's a, an example for the rest of the industrial community. And Shane, you're an active member of the new Mount Maunganui Air Quality Working Party? We, we certainly are, um, and I, I think influence outside of that as well, you know, with other senior leaders to make sure that um, they see our example as, as another way we do it as well. Thank you, gentlemen, for a very informative presentation. Um, and I appreciate your willingness to come and share um, uh, what you're doing. And also, um, did I hear you say that you're willing to share your ear monitoring data? Yes, that, which would be great. Um, if you don't mind, I know your focus has been on equality, but uh, I'd just like to ask a question about your stormwater treatment. I noticed that you've got a, a consent and um, I also see that you know you're um, washing down trucks, etc., to to ensure that there's no uh, fertilizer residue on them. So, what happens to that water before it goes into the harbour? So we have a, a north and south stormwater sump. Uh, that water is treated uh, to ensure that we get it back up to a neutral pH of seven, so we can it can enter back into the harbour, and it's. <sighs> I can't tell you off the top of my head what the volume is, but we hold a tremendous amount of water on site to ensure that we can um, we don't um, pollute uh, the harbor in any way. And and so much so that we've got a 20, 20, 30 year study in terms of harbor health that we've commissioned every two years and uh, which is not on our company website. But we had the discussion this morning that it will be uh, talking about the improvements um, and how the harbor health is actually improving uh, in the estuary beyond uh, balance and, and directly in front of us. And, and through the steps that we've taken to ensure that we don't, we don't pollute the waters in any way. So. Councillor McDonald. Turn your mic on. Sorry. Um, welcome and thank you for your presentation. Um, I do recognise your, your faces from the uh, meeting we had last week. Um, uh, probably uh, a couple of questions um, from me and um, listening to you. Thank you for the stats that you presented. I just want to know, and obviously you've got an ongoing uh, relationship with Whareroa, and uh, we're currently sitting around the table at the moment to try and work together to resolve those issues. So, yeah, I accept that. But you um, showed a series of graphs to us this morning and um, explained that you've managed to identify the times when it becomes a problem for you with the exceedances. Uh, my first question is around, do you advise the communities at that point that you're having an issue issue there, um, i.e. specifically Whareroa? So they, are they aware that at that point that there are issues in that vicinity? Yes. 
Yes, we do. So I, I'll call Joel um, uh, and notify him if we've had any exceedances on site. Um, even if the, the regional council monitors, because we have we also have our own monitor on the Madai as well. Just, I'm aware of that. Yeah, so we will we'll notify Joel if we've had any exceedances uh, on the monitors that we have. Thank you for that. My other question um, is around uh, something I think that all of us that sit around that uh, working uh, table realise from the last committee. Um, you know, we acknowledge that you um, are a key part of, of the economy. You you talked about intergenerational employment, and I'd acknowledge, uh, acknowledge that. Um, you provide fertiliser across the country. But I think one of the realisations I guess I want to share around this table and, and with you as well, because you would have heard it yourself, is that whole social responsibility that we all have. And I think we've all neglected it. So uh, I guess my question for you is, in, in this fabulous present presentation that you've given us this morning, would you think about having a social overlay in our or in the social responsibility we now have? You spoke about it um, making sure that you look after people. People are at the centre of your of your operations and you care directly for your staff, which is admirable. But would you take that a step further to then apply that really now to the adjacent communities where you sit? Uh, because that, that, that's also going to be a challenge for us as a regional council, is how we then ourselves place a social overlay on the work of the responsibilities that we have. I just want to have your view uh, on that. <laughs> all, the, all the steps we are taking is to ensure that we, we lessen our impact on the community around us, and, and specifically our neighbors, our residential neighbors, uh, first and foremost. Um, as, as the site manager, I, obviously I have a responsibility to make sure that it's the safest environment for the people I have on site. Second to that is everyone that just sits outside of the fence. And all the steps that we're taking in terms of our capital investment, our monitoring, um, th that they're, our neighbors, and, and Fariroa specifically, is, is always a part of our decision-making process uh, for whatever activities we can do or whatever we can do to actually uh, mitigate uh, the, our impact uh, for them. So, so, kia ora, Councillor MacDonald, and, and can I please extend the same invitation to you? I know um, we didn't get you to site to look around, but um, you'll see us all leaning into that uh, question because very, very much so that's uh, a key strategy for our business is our social licence to operate, which goes beyond uh, permits and, and, and consents, etc. It's about how we interact with the community. So we do have um, a community council that, that Charlie chairs for the site. Um, we did invite a number of people to be on that. Certainly Whareroa is, is uh, represented further into the community. We've asked a number of people to step onto that. And that's about holding us to account to do as we say we're going to do and on this journey of continuous improvement. So the answer is absolutely wholeheartedly yes. And from the lead team, we welcome any interactions with interested community groups. Gentlemen, there being no further questions, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, let's keep the dialogue open. I'm pleased to see, Charlie, that your you know your PM10 monitors are available to us and the community. That's great, uh, and you are in touch with Joel if ever there is a exceedance. That's good to know. But thank you for your presentation, and um, we wish you well. Okay, our next uh, presentation this morning is from the Bay Conservation Alliance, and I'd like to welcome Michelle Elborn and Julian Fitter. Is that, yep, cool. Good morning, uh, Michelle and Julian. Welcome to our Monitoring and Ops Committee, uh, and the floor is yours. You have a presentation, I believe, Michelle? Yes, yep. Like to introduce yourselves and yeah. turn your mic on, Michelle. That green, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Um, kia ora koutou. Good morning. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come and speak with yourselves this morning. Um, so, as you know, I'm Michelle Elborn, the manager of Bay Conservation Alliance, and you'll know um, Julian Fitter as um, chair of Bay Conservation. Um, so, the main reason for our visit this morning is to just give you a little bit of an update 
on um, largely the educational space that bay conservation plays in, um, and in particular sort of in relation to some of the funding that we've received from yourselves. So um, we are coming to the end of our three-year term of community initiatives funding from yourselves, which allowed us to develop a new nature education program. Um, so just a reminder, that contract um, funded us to engage 10 schools a year for the three years that we've had the funding. And the intention of that program was to develop a coordinated education offering across some of our member group sites. So the priority education sites have been at Ongatiti um, in the Kaimaimamakus, um, raising awareness around the restoration needs of the conservation park and relating to the work that Ongatiti Forest Project undertakes as a community entity, and then um, Otani Wanuku um, supporting the Kiwi Trust. Um, over certainly the first year was really about sort of building the foundations and the offering of that program and seeking um, interest from schools. And we, we managed to secure 10 schools in that year. Year two, um, certainly we started to see some significant growth. Um, unfortunately, COVID did have an impact on us last year in terms of the numbers. Um, but as you'll see for the 1920 financial year, we were on track to deliver to about 1500 students, which we were really delighted with 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 the budget sort of available um, that was a really great outcome for us um, a significant loss for us last year was in term two where we had 400 students alone that we were going to be delivering to Taranga Boys College and when I visited you last time I talked about a desire to move our attention more to the college level students so there's quite a lot of environmental education offerings in primary and intermediate that really falls away at the college level in terms of what's available to schools. Um, and it's certainly it's, it's the time where we've got young people forming their ideas around career pathways. And it's the time in life where young people might be thinking about volunteer opportunities. And as we well know, many of our community conservation groups, one of the key things they flag is aging volunteers and a concern to engage younger people into the mahi. So that's one of the rash rationales around us moving our focus to college level students. So while we lost those 400 students, in term two last year. We tried really hard to get them on board later in the year, but because of the significant commitment that school was making and the challenges last year, it, it didn't happen. But I'm pleased to advise that they have booked in for term two this year. So fingers crossed, we're hoping that we get to deliver. Um, so we're on track to deliver to about 1,300 uh, students for this financial year, and that's actually across 14 different schools. Um, a big part of it as well is trying to bring in um, the, I guess, the skill um, knowledge, uh, conservation skills, and bringing in technologies like GIS. So the work that we're doing with Taranga Boys, for example, will be including GIS and they'll be doing GIS technology um, activities when they get back into the classroom. The other thing that I would note is that we've been working quite hard to work in with other education providers. So one of um, your other um, funded providers is Emma Richardson through Discovery Through Nature. We work really closely with Emma. She has a focus around more of the estuaries, water side of things. Ours has a big forest focus um, currently. So we sort of work together in terms of ensuring that there is an offering essentially from mountains to sea. So um, we also received some environmental enhancement funding from yourselves last year, just under two and uh, six and a half thousand dollars. And that was to assist us in the development of a new education site, Otiora, near Whakamaramara. Um, so some of you may be aware that that um, relates to Anne Mackesy's land and um, Otomotai College. And a trust was set up to manage a site. It was an education site set up in the late 70s. And it's been quite significantly underutilized. And it is a beautiful, amazing location. Has some facilities out there. Um, and so Anne and the trust have been really supportive in us increasing the use of that site. Um, so what we applied for through EEF was some funding to put a new trapping network into that site. There's QE2 covenanted um, beautiful bush. So we had funding to apply trapping across a new uh, five hectares of land. There's been no um, pest control work in that site to date. And the intention of that is to use it 
for management in terms of pest control, but but at large also um, for education. So we've had Otomato College students in there doing some monitoring work and thinking about how they can have an involvement in the longer term um, management of that space. And we hope to involve other schools over time. Again, it had been somewhat delayed. Um, we had hoped to launch that in October last year, and we've really just got going this year. Um, at, uh, interesting, I didn't realise that Balance were, promote, were um, presenting before us. So Balance came on board as a corporate sponsor for us last year, um, in particular around um, our education work. And we had some significant conversations with them about that being more meaningful than funding towards our education programme and what kind of partnership we could build. Um, their CEO, Mark, has a real interest in the predator-free 2050 movement. And on discussions around that, we came to an agreement that we would develop um, some corporate days for balanced staff. We thought that he would be sort of asking for maybe 35 staff to go through a program. They actually want all of their staff to go through over time, so 300 and odd staff. And so we've held our first um, corporate day last month at Oteora. Um, and I've just got a little short video that I'll play for you on that day. It's, it's really important to understand there's many ways you can contribute. Everybody can contribute in a way to be sort of comfortable with them, doesn't it? without hauling dead possums out, swinging them over your head, etc. It's yeah, it's something for everyone. So Balance uh, are a sponsor. They came on board last year for our education program, and we had a chat after they watched some of our education delivery, and they thought they'd like to be even more on a practical sense, on a practical level, and do some mahi. So we had a talk, and we are now here at Otiota today to actually set up a trapping pest control operation. So very excited. So today we're going to have a little bit of session understanding the situation we're doing. So we just send them off willy nilly, sort of setting traps. A bit of it was really interesting. I hadn't understood just how big a problem it was, and also I didn't know the history behind the introduction of those animals and what it was like years ago and why we've got such a focus on it. It kind of makes more sense to me now why it's important to do this. Basically, uh, works on a landscape scale. So we have, uh, I think it's 20 odd members now throughout the Kaimai Mamakus and down on the on, on, on the beachfront. And so what we do is connect, join everything up. And so from here, starting off with five hectare site, we will move forward around those other sites. So we're actually on a landscape scale predator control. Yeah, awesome to actually get out and do some much work and um, find your way to put those traps in place. and. Um, you know, hopefully kill some of those little ferrets and uh, um, rodents that we saw today. It feels like we've actually done something and I'm grateful for the opportunity to do it. I don't know if I'd do it on my own. Nature is the key to New Zealand lifestyle, so we need to look after what is here and make sure that it's there for future generations. We can't do this without this involvement. We, you know, we all have to do this. So we've got amazing conservation care groups doing volunteer labour. But the group board uh, would get support, not just financial, but we need the, we need the feed on the ground. So if we can put both of those together with our constant uh, groups, it's just yeah, that's how we're going to do this. Cool. So I guess what I'd like to sort of note there is. It's, it's an opportunity to think differently about how we engage volunteers and the work that needs to occur on the ground um, and engaging corporates and others is certainly an area um, that I think we can tap and that was the opportunity that we saw in terms of this relationship here. Um, many of you may be aware that we are now running a program called Bay Conservation Cadets, Tawera Mahi, and I do want to acknowledge in particular Pim de Monchi when this idea was born back in April last year and we talked to Pim um, and he agreed to put that idea forward through your economic sort of recovery committee. And the idea was sent down to Wellington. Um, so a, a very big thank you. We were somewhat surprised when we were selected to be a funded um, program. Um, so as you'll be aware, um, that received $3.5 million over five years. 
Um, we are now underway, having launched in January and six weeks into our first 12-week um, program. We'll be training 150 cadets over a five-year period, running three programs a year. Um, and it's a very experiential learning focus, so it's very hands-on. It's out in the field at large, and it's all about skill development, so in predator control, in outcomes monitoring, in the use of GIS, um, getting an insight into career paths, whether it be as a dog handler for doc, um, wildlife rehabilitation, a whole range, water quality monitoring, a whole range of different things. And what's really important to us is... In, in our core purpose of supporting community conservation groups is that we're taking a lot of this effort into our existing um, conservation groups, whether that be Otani Wanuku saying, hey, we've never actually done any invertebrate monitoring. Could you bring the team to assist and provide that data back to us? So in this first program, I think we're operating across about five of our different member group sites. And as time goes on, we're saying to all of those community conservation groups, what help do you need that can be provided through some meaningful work experience with with our cadets and focusing it there. So again, and I hope the, um, I hope the volume is a little better, but this is a little video that MFE has just produced on the program. It makes me feel really good because I've wandered around on the planet not knowing where I want to go or what I want to do, but I definitely feel like I'm, I'm heading in the right direction now. The Bay Conservation Cadets Tauira Mahi is a five-year program, three and a half million dollars funding, and in that time, 150 cadets uh, trained, employed during that period of time as well. So everything ranging from pest control, predator control, weed, planting plans, uh, outcomes monitoring, conservation dogs, a huge array of subjects as a sort of a, an appetizer to what's actually out there as a full-time um, career. I'm a kaitiaki, looking after the things in the bush, to the rivers and the streams, to the moana. That actually brings the mauri back, the life essence, the energy, the good energy that needs to be given back to, to Papatunuku, Ranginui, all of that, instead of taking, taking all the time. They're just hungry for this knowledge, and that's what inspires me as an educator. She's just released her eggs into the water column, and um, she's basically sacrificed her life. But for me, it's being able to bring them outdoors so they can actually be in nature and see how it connects. Sorry, they all look like lompins, which is unusual, isn't it? They're... The best way they can experience it is hands-on, getting out there and doing it, being at one with the environment that we have. So how often do you monitor the eel? So we monitor our stream twice a day. Because you see the passion in their eyes. It just lights up when they're out here. This is such a big investment in people, creating confidence, self-esteem, awareness of what's possible. So it's a huge social investment that's going on here as much as anything. So I fuck a papa from Pirirako and haven't really known anything about my fuck a papa and I've slowly been learning about who I am and where I come from. So this is going to really help me to understand a lot as well. It's been really incredible, yeah. I used to wake up when I had my old job and think, oh, I think i got to go to work, but now I'm like excited to go to work. <laughs> actually making a difference in the world. Absolutely loving it. All the field work is amazing. We're learning so many different things and I can see everybody in the course getting careers in conservation, definitely. The Jobs and Nature program has been fantastic for, for what it's allowing these cadets to be able to see. that They're on the start of something here. This is life-changing and so it's just going to grow and grow. Cool. So the other thing that I thought I would share with you just is, is the growth in the support team that now sits under BCA. And in part, that's come through the contract with MFE, um, but also with us securing some funding through DOC last year. Um, so DOC is trialing regional conservation hubs and they selected six different entities around the country. So we have funding with them for two years. Um, and I think we had previously mentioned to you we were really aspiring towards having some operations roles sitting in Bay Conservation. We now have two. So Emma Cronin is our operations manager in the Western Bay and Wayne O'Keefe is our operations manager in Fakatani, um, covering at large the Eastern Bay and Rotorua. Um, we've had quite a lot of growth in our membership, particularly in the Eastern Bay um, over the last year. So we now have 19 member groups, having started with four. Um, and so it's fantastic to have those two operations roles in place. 
they each have now sort of nine or ten member groups that they are the go-to people for those groups with whatever needs they have. That's at a relatively sort of strategic level. So where those groups are, for example, or supporting the administration of those groups. So if they are doing a toxin campaign and they are needing to apply for DOC and MOH permissions, it is a huge process. They can now... Um, engage Emma and Wayne to undertake those processes on their behalf like likewise with wildlife permits quite a challenge working through DOC on those kind of um, paperwork activities um, likewise with supporting them with um, challenges around volunteer engagement or whatever it might be um, Brian's moved from our education manager with schools now into full-time role managing the cadetship which meant means that we now need to bring on somebody else to manage the school education work. And we're really very excited to have Janie Stevenson joining our team as of term two this year. Um, so she'll be a fantastic asset. Um, and as you well know, Janie has a wide set of skills around sort of um, en engagement and facilitation and so on. Um, so she'll bring a real strength. Um, and we um, had Remedy join us late last year as well, who's providing some finance and admin support at large to the cadetship because everything has scaled up very significantly for us um, in the last six months. But also Remedy has lots of skills around sort of the technology side of things and IT. And so we're being able to offer things to our groups like setting up MailChimp on their websites, um, helping them with um event management and those kind of areas. So we hope to see that continue to grow. And just to wrap up, um, really is just to say that um, you will be seeing us again through your long-term planning process. We understand that you are doing some engagement around volunteer management, and that is obviously a space that we are heavily involved in. So we will be um, coming back to you to sort of share some, some ideas and thoughts around that. Um, just so that you're aware with the DOC funding that we received last year, there's, there's quite a bit of evaluation in terms of actually the outcomes that entities like us will be delivering. And so there is a, um, a, quest, a, a survey out with our 19 member groups at the moment, which the results of that I think will be really useful. Um, and I'll be happy to, sh to share with you at a future visit. And also just to say um, that we are just um, starting a review of conservation strategic plan so that was due to run until 2022 but we felt like there's been so much change in the last 12 months actually it's time to um, just have a thorough look at our sort of purpose and ensure that we're meeting the needs of a very much changing environment right now with jobs for nature and so many things coming on stream in the last 12 months um, so that review um, will be completed throughout April and I will open up to questions thank you like to make? Yeah. Uh, kia ora, councillors. Kia ora, Chairman. Um, yes, um, I guess when I s actually set this um, organisation up um, with a key assistance from Councillor Thompson, um, one of my, the things I said um, was I wanted the organisation to be a partner with councils and with DOC. Um, and it's been a pretty, you know, to begin with, Obviously, pretty rocky road, you might say. I mean, well, no, not rocky, but a, but a slow growth road. Uh, and, and we've made really good progress uh, in that time. And certainly, the, 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 in the, the bringing in of the MFE funding for the, uh, for the um, conservation cadets has really changed things. And I really do feel that we are actually at the point where, you know, the, the key behind the whole thing with Bay Conservation is working together. And I do feel that we need to, you know, partner with the councils and with DOC to start talking about bigger projects because the problem I see is that we've got lots and lots of little groups around doing very good things. But until we join those groups up, until we start working together with them, uh, we won't really make the difference. So I really, you know, the support the council has given has been fantastic um, in reality. We, 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 and we, but the nice thing about what we've done is we've grown gradually 
admittedly, the last year has been a bit of a, a, a <laughs> steep curve, but we've got the basics in 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 place so that we you know we we, we have a, a team to work on. And now that we've got the strategic review coming up, that will actually look and see exactly how big we want to go. I mean, I must admit, I'm a bit more ambitious than Michelle probably, because <laughs> <laughs> I can have ambition, she has to carry them out, <laughs> which is more difficult. But no, you're, you know, I, I think what you've seen today um, is a pretty good example of, of what working together can do. Uh, and because of, uh, because you've supported us, we got the support from MFE. Uh, and that gives us and I think one of the interesting things about those students is you actually that you need that training to go into the bush or go into onto the beach and do work you need to understand it um we have a couple of, of um uh, young people who we employ at, at the makatoa natural wetland society and the, and they actually could have done with that training first it would have been really useful to they've gone through that course before they started with us because it gives them a, a, a good broad picture uh, but but anyway, thank you for your support and yeah, oh, happy very, to ask, answer very good. any questions. Thank you. For, so there's questions coming. So um, Councillor uh, White and then Clark. Councillor White. Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation and I think you're, you're on the mark and looking at developing the cadetships and the concepts behind that. Um, I noticed that, you know, you're talking about alliances and partnerships and uh, Bay of Prince Regional Council, MFE and the private sector. So I want to acknowledge balances support for you as well. I think it's a good thing to do. Um, my question is obviously coming down the track is with iwi and, <laughs> and what, what level of iwi engagement is there and, and participation because I know a project like this would sit well with a lot, number of the land trusts and the corporations who would be interested in, in promoting this sort of thing. So are you, are you connecting in that space at all and developing any alliances? Yeah, um, yeah, that's a really great question, and, and and actually that's one of the main reasons that I was really keen to go through a strategic plan review because I think it's an area that we could do much better in. So we, I would say that we've been incrementally building um, relationships with Iwi on our journey, um, and and acknowledging that that takes time, and that often that you've got to have kind of a shared objective to really build those those partnerships and relationships. Um, we've been sort of heavily involved in the Monarchy Kaimamamiku process, and that's enabled some relationships to start. Um, we have a sort of a policy around really wanting to support our member groups who are on the ground to build their relationships with their local um, iwi hapu um, around those particular sort of projects, um, but how we can help and support that. So, for example, um, one of the events that we held last year for our membership groups was a workshop on iwi engagement, and we put to Put together a panel of, of iwi um, sort of leaders, I guess, um, in, in the region that were happy to come along and support us for that night and sort of worked through the steps around, you know, building good relationships and, um, and from that workshop acknowledged that this is an area that we really want to sort of build and grow. We do not have um, iwi representation, for example, on our board at the moment. It's something we discussed right at the beginning and we sought advice on. Um, my view is I don't want it to be tokenistic or I want to build real kind of relationships and partnerships and I wouldn't say that we've got the answer to that perfectly yet. I can comment then um, Iwi Hapu are really important obviously to connect with uh, a, a, a lot of the decisions for the land is made by land trust and corporations selected by Iwi and Hapu so for example for example, in my jurisdiction, there's 60,000 odd hectares of land owned by Māori, and a lot of it is in conservation connection states as well, you know, native bush. Same would be in the East Bays, large areas, and Tauranga Moana. So it is a big opportunity. And if you can bridge that particular connect point, I think it'll go a long way because the concepts behind this are really good. I agree. Thank you. Councillor Clark, then Rose. Yeah, um, thanks, Michelle. Um, Tataru asked part of the question, but yeah, my concerns around where we're going forward in this nature conservation space are demographic and ethnic. Um, we do have a, a, a demographic that's probably sitting in its mid-60s. We've got to lower that. And also, uh, with all due respects to the other culture, the words kaitiaki and mahi come around. One of spouse is kaitiaki, but others seem to be doing the mahi in the stage. And we actually need to get together so that we actually get everybody in the same groups together going forward. So I'd look forward to how we can assist you with our impending addition to our environmental enhancements fund to make going forward jointly and 
sorting that out. So, cheers. Uh, Councillor Rose, then McDonald. Uh, yep, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I just wanted to ask a question in regards to your um, nature education. Um, now, having experienced and seen how um, different organisations across the country do this sort of thing, um, students kind of get that one-off that one off training and then that's it. So has Bay Conservation Alliance got any um, ideas or plans in the loop about further training for those um, for those rangate who want to continue that space? Because I know that we talk about um, growing our volunteer groups and lowering their age. Um, so is there any ideas in the loop with you guys around further training for those rangate at school? I mean, I guess now I do see that the cadetship program is an opportunity. So particularly where we're working with college level students and, and if that sort of opens their eyes to wanting to then go further, um, then the cadetship is open for age eight, 18 and up. Um, so that does provide a sort of a pathway and an opportunity. Um, I think the idea of just connecting young people into existing community conservation groups, which, as noted, often is, you know, 60 and up, isn't necessarily the right model. So I think we've thought a lot, you know, oh, let's get younger people into existing models. It doesn't necessarily work. So I think we need to do some more thinking around new models that work better, particularly for our younger people. And that's the space that we'd like to explore further in the future. And just a follow-up question on that as well, um, what's, what's your guys' relationships like in regards to um, the politics and the university, um, in particular out in the Eastern Bay and Rotorua? Um, Eastern Bay and Rotorua are no relationships as yet. So I think now with Wayne sort of coming on board and being embedded into that community and having a lot of connections there, we'll be and he just came on board late last year. So we'll be able to start building our relationships much more strongly. We've certainly evolved out of the Western Bay and our relationships here are stronger. Um, we we have conversations with the poly with Toyohumai and University of Waikato, but interestingly, we really tried to involve Toyohumai in the cadetship development and they didn't they didn't choose to um, come on board so we've developed that independently. Can I just add on the education front that um, certainly the Makatu and Atra Wetland Society education mm -hmm. program which is linking in with the Bay Conservation one is much more sophisticated than just the, you know taking the kids out once a term it's it's structured in, and it deals with I think Tanya's dealing with eight or nine schools including the the Tipuki High School uh, and it's trying to you know every every term there is a different focus on the, the dunes or on the bush or on the on the rocky shores so there's that we're developing a, a more structured program throughout, and I think I think the the one thing that's probably missing is funding from the education sector itself. Mm. Uh, Councillor McDonald. Thank you for your presentation. Um, you're very excited uh, with what's happening about your Bay Conservation Training Program. I just want to acknowledge uh, my meeting with you uh, when I pr approach Bay Conservation myself around um, training for Hapuiwi and specifically um, that day we were speaking about the Kaitiakitanga of of Maui. Uh, so um, thank you for that. I also want to acknowledge that um, you're it appears that you're definitely on the right path to securing that relationship with Hapuiwi because I had, couldn't help but notice that you had Aroha Ririnui in your um, video. And she's a pretty tough cookie, that lady. And to get her to attend your um, uh, <laughs> your training, uh, well done to you. Um, but um, Yeah, so she's not being trained, but she's coming along and helping okay. with some of the delivery. Yeah, well, the mere fact yeah, that she is, recognises your yeah. organisation as um, having value I guess, um, speaks volumes for you. Um, the other thing I wanted to um, acknowledge too is that I totally agree with you about it's crucial that we join up the dots. Um, I think if we don't join up the dots, we're, we're acting in isolation of ourselves and what's happening around us. So I fully support that. Um, if there's uh, any contribution and how I can help in that space, I'm willing to. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Julian, uh, for your presentation. Uh, we look forward to your submission, Michelle, for our long-term plan. 
this council intends to be bold in this to LTP in terms of supporting volunteer groups. Uh, so we look forward to your submission and continue the partnership that we have uh, engaged in and working with you. So, uh, thank you very much Kia ora, for your presentation. Thank you. thank you. Our third presentation for this morning, we're going to carry on through, is uh, Greg Corbett. Uh, Greg's going to give us an update on catfish, aquatic pests and wallabies. And Greg presented to the Lakes Water Quality Society AGM, oh, for, when was it, Greg? Can't remember. January, yeah. long time ago, um, on, on the work he's doing. So I thought it was value to bring it here today. But welcome along, Greg and Chris, and the floor's yours. Uh, thank you, Chair. More on the councillors. Um, yeah, as the Chair's already alluded to, um, this is basically a presentation that was provided to Lakes Water Quality Society at their um, AGM back in, I think it was the 1st of February. Um, and we've just provided a few extra updates of work that's um, happened um, since that time. Yeah, so just a quick overview of what we'll quickly cover off. Um, um, some of this um, won't be new news to you, but um, We'll talk about the Regional Pest Management Plan, the catfish program, where we're at with that um, at the moment, um, the little bits of work that we're doing with Lynn's on uh, lakeweed, and then that, um, that rotor question around wallabies. Um, so, so firstly, um, obviously we do have a new RPMP, um, uh, just noting that it is under appeal that we're working through at the moment with Forest and Bird. Um, it includes 17 aquatic pests and um, we're currently our operational funding putting in just over a million dollars um, into aquatic pest management across the region. Not all of that is in Rotorua. Um, obviously things like alligator weed um, and, and uh, yellow flag iris, um, some of that work occur, um, occurs elsewhere in the region as well. Um, the new RPMP, the biggest change there for the aquatic side in particular was Rule 7 where We've got now um, much stronger and clearer rules around um, preventative measures for um, stopping the spread of, um, of, of pest fish and pest weeds. Um, sorry. Yeah. Um, so alongside those new rules, we've um, trained and engaged um, a number of Te Arawa staff to help with our um, compliance at boat ramps. And they've been operating since the start of the trout fishing season around um, the Te Arawa Lakes um, from the 1st of October. Um, to date, they've completed just over um, 1,000 inspections of um, boats and trailers um, entering the lakes. And really pleasing to see that we've got um, about a 99% compliance. Now, that's basically meaning that the, by far the majority of our people using our lakes are turning up clean. Now, whether that's um, good management on their part or just good luck, um, don't really know. But anyway, it's a, it's a really high compliance rate, which is really good. Um, the second part of the work that they've been doing um, in the new year is just checking um, with the new self-certification rule. So Rule 7, part of Rule 7 in the RPMP requires um, lake users to self-certify that they have checked, cleaned and dried their vessel prior to um, entering the lakes. Um, the Te Arawa staff have collect, collect, um, collectively done nearly 600 inspections so far with a 20% compliance. And I actually think at the moment that was surprisingly good given that we haven't done much awareness, on, um, awareness raising on this to date. Um, and the feedback that we've had um, about the self-certifying um, information would, would appear to be that we've probably got a bit of work to do about making that a little bit more obvious than what we've done. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm reasonably happy with where that's at the moment. Yes, we've got a bit more work to do um, um, with, with that. Moving on to um, catfish. The story here isn't really a pretty one. Um, we are um, probably tracking, even though the graph doesn't really show that at the moment, um, we are probably tracking by, for by far our biggest capture um, since we've started. Um, and the capture rates at the moment are indicating that the, it's about 10 times higher um, than what we were at this time last year. And as I say, the, the graph dips away there because we've only got, um, um, we're only part of the way through our netting um, program. Um, 
as we sat there, um, the catch rate to date's um, about 135,000 um, fish, um, predominantly out of Lake Rotoiti, but a few of them are out of Lake Rotorua as, as well. On top of that effort, we've got um, obviously the Catfish Killers Program, which really has been um, um, just a fantastic example of community in engagement. Um, the work that uh, William Manaru and the Te Ara Lakes Trust here has just been fantastic. Um, 1,500 volunteers um, have been um, involved at some stage or another. Um, I think he's got about 13 schools now engaged in helping with the program. And while the number of fish that they've removed from the lake is relatively low, that um, storytelling and that engagement from those young people um, and getting them engaged in biosecurity work is going to be a real winner for us in, in the years to come. Um, I think as we've already talked to the committee about, this program is also being seen as um, just a fantastic example of bicultural leadership. Um, it's been acknowledged through um, the 2019 Biosecurity Awards um, with this program winning the Supreme Award. And then last year through the Society for Local Government Managers also winning the Supreme Award there, um, which is just um, great acknowledgement for Tiara and the work that they've done. Um, a bit on the research to date, um, we've been um, trying quite a few different things. Some things have worked, some things haven't. Um, the first on the list there has been the pheromone baits. Um, um, if you can remember all the way back to about 2017, we were investigating a bait that Niwa were developed for perch control. And when they were playing around with that pheromone bait, which was targeting perch, they found they were catching quite a lot of catfish. Um, so we looked at expanding that out, and yeah, the bait is um, um, does attract noticeably more catfish to the nets than just netting alone, but it's really expensive. Um, so at the moment, it's not really cost effective. It's actually more uh, more effective for us to significantly increase our netting effort to catch the same number of fish compared to using um, that bait. Um, the environmental DNA, um, it was a bit of work done through um, NIWA again and the University of Waikato to, um, to get this operational. Um, and we've done now 68 sites. Um, so that's now part of our operational toolkit for surveillance of, of um, other lakes. And it's um, showing itself to be surprisingly um, sensitive. We're picking up um, in Lake Tauwera, for example, wallabies in the, in the, in, in the water. Um, and some surprising things, um, there was some tuna and things picked up in the lake, which made us scratching our heads until worked out that there's a whole lot of blackback gulls on top of Rua Wahia that fly to and from the coast. So they're undoubtedly um, um, feeding on um, remnants of, of seafood flying back, defecating in the lake on their way through, and we're actually picking that up in, in the DNA sample. So, um, yeah, a really um, valuable tool. We've looked at brown trout as a potential um, biocontrol. Obviously, there is brown trout present in um, Lake Rotowiti in relatively low numbers, um, and we looked at the option of deliberately releasing more brown trout into, into the lake there. Um, Nati Pikiao expressed quite a few concerns about that. Um, they were already concerned about the impact of um, catfish on kura, and obviously more brown trout would um, would potentially you know, be an additional impact um, there. And then the Niwa were also advising that um, the, the actual temperature range in the lakes, the catfish quite happily live in that warmer water, and obviously the trout don't like that warmer water at all during the summer months. So there would be quite a period of time when um, the catfish, the juvenile catfish would be very vulnerable to trout predation. But at that time, they're living in the shallow water, warm water, and the trout would um, not really be um, moving in that same area. Um, we've worked with Dr. Ian Kusabs looking at um, the impacts of Kura. Um, and yes, um, sadly, in seeing now um, Kura populations rapidly declining in um, Lake Rotowiti where the catfish are. Um, the map that's up there um, relates to the final bullet point there, the acoustic um, monitoring. So if you remember, that was back in 2017, 18 and 19, we were looking at um, how catfish use the, use the lake. 
Um, this data has still been analysed, but basically if you're looking at the, the data, the each colour shows a different fish. These things are highly mobile. They're using, um, they're moving around the lake um, widely, um, and they're using a relatively similar temperature range or depth range is what we see in Lake Taupo. So um, our, our fish here are going slightly deeper to about 22 metres compared to just under 20 metres in Taupo. And that's probably just uh, um, a temperature thing again. The, um, our Lake Roto Eti is likely to be a little bit warmer than, than Taupo. Still on the, um, the research front, um, you'll recall last year we brought a paper to the committee on the use of sterile males as a potential biocontrol. Um, we're currently working with Niwa on this, so we've now taken 60 catfish up to um, Niwa's fish farming um, facility at Whangarei, and they're currently going through the process of learning how to um, induce spawning, raise the larvae, and then um, on to producing sterile males. Um, this work's proved a little bit more challenging than they initially anticipated. Um, there's currently um, quite a bit of knowledge about uh, closely related catfish in the States, which is used, which is farmed over there as part of just spinfish farming. And it was thought that a lot of the husbandry um, methodologies would be just applied directly into, into the um, brown bullhead catfish, but um, not so. But that said, they have managed to um, raise a number of, of, of larvae and um, that's given them quite a bit of hope and they've taken the learnings from that and they'll be growing on those learnings through the, the coming year. Um, moving quickly on to um, our lake weed control um, program with, with LINS. Um, LINS through last year's budget received significant additional funding to support their biosecurity um, programs across New Zealand. And this has basically led to a doubling of um, spraying in the Te Arawa, um, lakes. So this year we'll see um, 315 um, hectares um, um, across all the lakes um, tr treated. They're also putting in a new weed called on um, at the Otara Marae uh, boat ramp. Um, we did the first round of spraying November, December um, last year um, and had a, quite a big focus on Lake Okotaina trying to reduce the big beds of labrosiphon in that lake and that would hopefully um, allow us to find the, rem the few remaining hornwort plants in there more easily. Um, the monitoring to date would suggest that that program has been hugely successful um, and we're looking to build on that with our autumn spray program and are currently negotiating um, um, with Iwi about the potential of using helicopters to further increase the areas that we can spray in, in that lake. Um, and we've also trialled the use of um, uh, Endofol um, to treat the, um, the remnant um, hormone plants in Okataina. Um, and we used the uh, interfoil in a granular form and hand applied it directly to um, the plant. So you can see there the divers um, working and just applying the, the granules um, to the uh, plants as they find them. Yeah, um, yeah. so there's going to be further, further work on interfoil in Okataina this um, coming autumn. And moving on to, to wallabies. Um, so, this a lot of this is not new news um, to you. Um, obviously, we've got national funding now, and we've got um, our short-term objective around um, containing or stopping further spread of wallabies outside the containment area, and um, and then preventing further leakage out of the containment area. That's our, what we're immediately working to at, at the moment, and looking at the map there. It does look a little bit messy, but the the yellow rings showing where we're focusing control work at the moment, and the red circles showing where we're focusing surveillance work. We've got about 50 different operations um, planned for um, from um, um, October last year through to probably about September um, in this coming coming year. Um, the program is looking to. Um, also engage with iwi and with um, the community to support um, initiatives um, where they're already doing predator control or possum control 
and looking at how do we um, um, incorporate wallaby control into those programs of, of work. I know the Rotorua councillors and Councillor Clark attended um, a stakeholder hui that we had um, a couple of weeks ago, um, and it was quite... Um, Maybe not surprising that we had a really good engagement on wallabies as an issue, but for me, it was the first time I've ever sat in a room with federated farmers, with forest and bird, with deer stalkers, and had everyone on the same page. Um, yeah, unheard of, really, in, in my experience. So that's yeah, you know, a really good um, um, baseline for us to build a really good, solid program aiming towards that long-term goal of uh, of eradication. And yeah, and the last slide there is just um, want to talk briefly on just on some of the new stuff that we're looking at for wallabies. And this um, couple of photos here show um, the use of drones potentially for surveillance. Um, we've been working with Interpine. Uh, Interpine have um, been using thermal imaging for firefighting tools for a number of years now. Um, so they've got drones there that are equipped with thermal um, cameras, with optical cameras, with range finders, and, um, and their pilots are certified to fly at night time. So um, basically we did a, a small trial up behind the airport. Um, it um, quickly became obvious that any wallaby in open country, we would see it. And um, the, the photo off to the right there shows two wallabies sitting in on the edge of pine forest so were able to actually find wallabies in eight-year-old pines. Um, and again, for those that know anything about thermal imaging, thermal imaging is great as long, but it doesn't see through trees. But here we're able to see enough through gaps in the trees to actually still identify wallabies. How many wallabies compared to the total wall, um, population we're seeing, we don't know, but it was um, certainly of interest for us. We're also talking with um, environmental and conservation technologies here in Tauranga who um, are working with Predator Free to build drones to carry um, baits for very deliberate um, um, distribution. And we see this potential for um, treating geothermal areas uh, where we would never be able to get people um, in because of the health and safety issues. And that chair's all I've got. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Greg. Um, Greg, you mentioned the running total of catfish killed. Do we have a running total of wallabies that we've, we, the contractors are killing? You know, it'd be really good for us to know that we are, hunters are going out and getting 50 to 100 a night or something like that, a, a, a running total of wallabies killed. We could, we, we could certainly um, collate the numbers that have been shot, but yeah. obviously the numbers that have been poisoned, we would never, yeah, we would never know. And, and obviously the, the poisoning is, uh, you know, probably at the moment it's a bigger part of our program than, than the shooting. We should, yeah, back to the catfish, Greg. Um, no mention on possibly the use of the longfin eel as a predator uh, regarding catfish. But I think there were whispers of that earlier on. What happened? Is it not a runner? Um, um, again, it's a, a little, there's a few concerns there about the potential predation on Kura would be adding to the predation on them. Yes, they would certainly um, take a few um, catfish out, but they'd also be eating Kura as well. So there's a little bit of nervousness about that. Yeah. Councillor Thurston, did you have a question? Uh, yes, Greg, this is an excellent repeat of the presentation you did at the Lakeswater Quality Society meeting in Four Marks, Gemin, for bringing it here today. But, Greg, in terms of boat and trailer, surveillance. I know we're down to single digits, but just describe for me, from my own point of view, what is a non-compliant boat and trailer? Has it got weed dripping off it, or has it got water from another lake dripping out of the trailer, or how do you describe a non-compliant boat and trailer that you turn away at a jetty? You've just described it. Yeah, so, so, so any vessel turning up that's got weed fragments um, on it um, and, or, and or carrying water, yeah. Own up to having been at a, another... Um, if they've got... The, the rule is about that you cannot enter a water body. Um, you must have cleaned and dried your vessel prior to entry um, any water body, yeah. Councillor White? Uh, kia ora, Greg. 
Thank you for your report. Yep, I was at the Lake Water Quality Society and yeah, your presentation was well received there as well. So thank you for that. I just want to endorse your comments around Te Arawa Lakes Trust and the Catfish Collet Program. I, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit like when you look at the numbers, it's a bit like pushing it all uphill, working upstream, if you like. But I, I think um, one of the things that's coming out of it is a real social, cultural connect that's happening. 1,500 volunteers. I've got my office right next door to where they congregate and you can hear the chatter and the excitement and the passion about the work they're doing. And that's having a wonderful impact socially in terms of procuring those volunteers and giving them something to do that they feel is very positive. Having said that, of course, it's, it is a bit like pushing it all uphill because you're looking for a solution because ultimately the catfish killers is not really the solution required. It's it's, it's on its journey, but everything else needs to happen as well. So, but congratulations on that. I really do think it's on the wallaby side of things. I mean, we were there at the, the meeting that you mentioned with the, with all of those players and around the table. It was a good conversation. One of the things about the wallabies that intrigued me is that they're nice, very cuddly looking things that are very shy. People don't get to see them. I've only seen two and they're being roadkill. Um, you know, and then you've got a photograph of, of Skippy on the front passionate that we've got to kill this little rat. But it's but, but it's so cuddly. And for those of us who are from our generation, Skippy was a bit of a television hero. So I mean it's uh, you know communication was a big issue around how do you involve the community when they don't see it, but they see a nice fairy, cuddly little guy. Mm. So uh, I suppose I just put that on the table as as part of the remedy moving forward, better communication yeah. public. Yeah. Challenge noted. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Greg. Um, uh, comments have been noted. Uh, just for me, the self-certification forms, are they on our website? Because I couldn't find them. Um, yeah. uh, and are we developing an app for self-certification? Yeah, um, that's a really good point. I'll follow that up with the website. Yeah. Um, and yes, at the moment, just talking with Lucas yesterday about um, just freeing some of our funding up to be um, develop an app or channel funding into developing an yeah. app for that. For because I've seen the boxes, stainless steel boxes at the Blue Lake and Lake Okitika and thinking, oh, yeah, that's where they are, and just sign it and put it on your windscreen or put it back. But you know, just having it on the website as well for everybody yeah. to get a copy of it because we need to, we need to um, sell the sizzle in yeah. terms of ex better access for those forms. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, so Councillor Crosby? Well, just to ask me a question to you as, you know, um, Something that works on the lake a lot. The issue of <clears throat> most modern boats have uh, ballast availability. Yep. Uh, is that actually checked that it's emptied in the right place before it's transferred to another lake? Yeah, that's part of the self certification that you've emptied the ballast out from Lake Rotoiti onto the foreshore, so you're not carrying that ballast water. And you know, you'd be stupid as a as a, a yeah. boaty to carry a ton and a half Around, of yeah. water on your trailer anyway. From one lake to another because it is you know wear and tear on all the vehicles and i don't think most trailers can cope with an extra ton and a half of ballast water if you forget to take it out but um that's part of the self-certification that you it empty depends on the size of the boat sometimes it's a small amount but oh it is too but it it only needs a liter of water left in the ballast tank and you've got potentially a a, a pest or a weed yeah so that's part of the self-certification and just put up can we just put up that self-certification form? It's the orange form. If you know what you're looking for at the boat ramp, um, Shari, it's, it was that one on the right-hand side. And it's just an A4 cardboard. Fill it out, put it under your windscreen, or um, put it back in the box. Can we just have that, please? <laughs> yeah, that's it under number four. Yeah, um, the count here is slide four, so keep going back. back. That one. Yeah, there it is there. Yeah. The vessel craft trailer self-certification form. It's really easy to fill out. Uh, um, yeah, we're just in the process of doing a short little wee, uh, YouTube clip um, 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 using Corey from the Tower Lakes Trust demonstrating yep. how they do the checks and where to look. Yep, yeah. yep. And you'll see there it's, um, oh, I can't quite read it, but. 
it's it's about ballast, it's about weed free off your trailer um, and your motor and all those sorts of uh, anchor wells, that sort of thing. Right, okay, sure, thank, thank you, you, Greg. Thank you, Chris. We're adjourned for morning tea. Back in, back at, uh, oh, we'll give it, pushing 11.30. Recording's off. Okay, welcome back. We'll carry on with the meeting and we're on page 20, which is the Chair's report. Um, it's just receiving the report. A few items of interest there. The uh, environmental standards for fresh water. We've got the water shortage event management for 2021. Uh, stock bank integrity, responsibility for the arena dive boys. Is that boy in place? Is some, can somebody tell me where that boy is in place? Yes. Uh, three, Chair, the, um, the boy should be in place by the end of the month. Uh, it was supposed to be um, put in place on the wreck last week, but the supplier is in Auckland, and with the COVID lockdown, things have just um, been postponed slightly. And we have an update later on in the meeting about the offsets uh, and the Provincial Growth Fund update in terms of Crown infrastructure funded projects and jobs for nature. Uh, are there any questions? And then we've got an update from the resource consents. Um, are there any questions on the Chair's report, please? Councillor Nees? Um, thank you. Just with, with regard to the resource consent update on page 24, yep. we've got 17% of customers are very dissatisfied or um, yes. dissatisfied. Um, can we have a breakdown? I, there, there's a difference between being dissatisfied because you don't get your resource consent, you don't get the response that you want, and being dissatisfied because you didn't think the customer service was up to standard or responsive enough. So can we have a bit of a more detail about the the reason for the dissatisfaction um, as, a, as a drill in? Um, and then that was one uh, comment slash question. And then on page 21, um, there's some commentary there about farm plans. And I uh, read an... Um, a newsletter or an email that came through, and I'm pretty certain it was for Project Perori, um, out of your Uratara Estuary Managers, who made a comment that they were working locally on a farm plan template and were hoping to get out and work with the local farmers. And I'm thinking, are we linked into that um, initiative because we know how much work is going on at a national level on farm plans? Uh, in response to the first question, um, Councillor Nees, at each subsequent um, snapshot, we will provide that breakdown. Uh, we did ask Ruben to um, let us know what some of the commentary was, and often people just say, I'm not satisfied, so they don't provide any uh, information, further information on that. But uh, where we did have it, so we've got stop requiring consultation with iwi groups, that was one comment, why someone was dissatisfied. Um, it's not much we can do to respond to that, but there are some good learnings for us um, in that we need to provide more regular updates. So rather than just having potentially two um, communication points at the beginning of the consent and at the end, if we are kind of weekly checking with applicants on where the process is. Um, and another comment was the system's too tight and tied up with regulations. So they're the kinds of comments that we're getting. Some we can um, action and some just... Councillor Eti and then Crosby. Uh, kia ora, Chair. Uh, my question is regarding the, uh, maybe more of a comment really, the Asian paddle crab uh, and that we are looking at uh, working closer with local hapu and iwi just with regards to the Ohiwa Harbour because we have actually had a presentation within the Ohiwa Harbour Implementation Forum about paddle crab but not really around how we, uh, our members participate in the monitoring. Uh, and how we move that forward, because I think it's really important to to action that. We we do have a meeting on Friday. Um, if we were able to somehow squeeze that, maybe I'll just bring it up as the as the chair on that. Greg, would you like to comment on that, please? Uh, 
Oh, boy. Kia ora. Kia ora. And, and, and just also including, uh, we've got a, a, a huge amount of care groups, so not just limiting to, to there's a lot of politics with, with Hapu and Iwi, and if we don't make much progress in that, that we have the care groups there as well that we should engage with. Kia ora. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd, I'd Hold on, like Councillor me. Crosby first, oh, uh, Martin Moana. Yep, then you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I do realise there's a specific agenda item coming up, re customer service, but one of the, and I'm not sure, um, Sarah, if we're doing it yet, a lot depends on the information you gather from the customer, and then there's a whole lot of art and science mixed around the analytics around that mm -hmm. to drill down to understand what the real issues are, just some kind of verbal response won't get us anywhere in improving that. So maybe later on in the agenda, when we talk about that specific item, we need to have a clear understanding of what information we gather with regard to customer service slash complaint, uh, how we analyse it, and is that sufficient to actually uh, invest in, in a better way forward? Thank you, Councillor Crosby. Councillor McDonald. No, oh. But um, I also wanted to um, express to Councillor Eti that I'll be a part of your discussion as well because I'll share with you what oh. we're actually doing in Tauranga Warner. We were actually out on the ground using um, the traps for the um, Asian paddle crab, which can be what the role looks like for actually Fano, Hapu, and uh, Iwi to be actually doing the main count. Uh, kia ora, Chair. Just, just another question uh, when I was reading through this report around the data services snapshot. And I'm just wondering, as a council, what sort of I guess, crystal ball gazing we're doing around technology advancements? Because when you look around the world, the advancements in AI with 5G coming on, uh, with uh, the availability of sensors now, how much attention we're giving across our whole business to technologies like AI and, and 5G and so forth. It's, it is a, a, a fast moving um, development that we are trying to um, keep in front of and I think a good example would be our telemetry and trying to make sure we can get real time um, rapid information uh, if everybody has access to um, or is close to a cell tower that our, all of our telemetered sites can be constantly um, sending through data. Uh, it, that sounds easy but it's not uh, and the staff are spending a lot of time trying to um, stay in front of that so that we're getting the best available information that we can um, as quick as possible and that includes getting information out to people and that's both part of um, our data services but also with civil defence um, and when we, we know that there are risks, how do we let the community know in the best possible way? Um, just from me, uh, Sarah, 2.8.4, the page 27, the National CME metric risk report, a huge volume of um, uh, compliance data collected, and I have hard copies of the CME report if people want it. I went on to the website to read it, and she's... Um, Somebody's taken a lot of time to monitor, to bring all that information together. So there are hard copies here. Councillor Love. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I just, uh, in response to Councillor Eti and, and for those people who perhaps weren't at the, or weren't attending or zooming into the risk and assurance meeting earlier in the week, we, we had a presentation from the head of IT, although she didn't speak on this particular occasion, and also from the head of IT security. And I have to say, and I commented at the time, that we really are ahead of the game. I'm, I am amazed for the type of organisation we are, how forward thinking we are in our use of IT and our use of technology. Uh, and we have to be commended. We have to commend the staff on, on what they're doing and commend the CEO on hiring the right people to do the job. Um, but it, it, I, I, part of my responsibility as risk and assurance is making sure we future-proof ourselves in that way. And to that end, I do have a, a quarterly meeting with those staff just to make sure I am aware of, of anything that, of everything which we are doing in that area. And if there is anything which is substantive, then I would be reporting it back to the council. 
Of any further questions? So there's a, a resolution on page, where are we up to, Shari? Chairman's report 20, just received the report. Do I have a mover? Councillor Rose, Councillor White, second. Any further discussion? I'll put that resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. Against carried. Moving on to the operational plan for the Bay of Plenty Regional Pest Management Plan. Mr Corbett again. This is page 33. Thank you, Chair. Um, really just like to um, table the report as read. Um, as Council will be aware, um, with the new RPMP that was adopted um, on the 17th of September, um, the Regional Council as management agency for the RPMP has got the responsibility of de developing an operational plan. Um, we've done that, we've presented it for the committee's consideration and approval today. Um, happy to take any questions, Chair. Any questions? Yes, yeah, just one. Um, adopting the plan in its entirety or partially, I'm just thinking the forest and bird appeal, is that going to be a hiccup in our pathway to adopting this? or? Uh, for you, Chair, um, only in that we may have to amend um, the operational plan should there be any changes as a result of that appeal. But the rest of it is operative, um, except for that one appeal. Uh, yes. so, so the the appeal, um, because the appeal wasn't against anything that's in the plan, the plan is itself has okay. is made operative. Yeah. The appeal is about potentially adding new stuff to the plan. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Nees. Oh, thank you. Just um, the wild king fruit, you've got a map there which shows a lot of infestations. Um, so with our partnership with um, NZKGI, do we expect that all of those would be dealt with in the next year or is that going to take a number of years? Um, for you, Chair, um, it will, yeah, so the expectation would be that we would just be systematically moving through those infestations. It's likely to take many years to go through and it'll just be a continual cycle. As, as I say, we're not likely to be eradicating. There will be regrowth coming through some of those areas and it will require retreating. So it is about just cycling through those areas. Yeah. Any further questions? Okay, there's a resolution on page 33. Oh, Councillor Browning, sorry. I was just uh, going to ask what happens to the plan now. Is it put up on our website? Uh, yes, so we do have to make it legally, uh, publicly, not legally, we do have to make it publicly available. Um, and we'll go onto our website and um, if there's any members of the public or anyone else who wants a copy of it, we make it available to them. Yeah. Is there, on page 33, there's three recommendations. Do I have a mover for those three recommendations? Councillor Thurston, seconder. Of Councillor Brunning, any further discussion? I'll put those resolutions. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against carried. Moving on to page 132. 132. So, this is the outline of the Marae Wastewater Project, and Councillor Von Daniels isn't here, but this is uh, great progress. Good morning. How are you? Uh, good morning, Chair and Councillors. Uh, I'm doing great. Thanks. Good. Um, all as Welcome well. Welcome along, Alex. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I just I'll I'll take uh, suggest we take this uh, report yep. as read, but I'll just give a couple of quick points for context and yep. introduction. Sorry, introduction. So, um, as you'll be aware, we've worked through the Tauranga Moana Osset project, which has now expanded to be a Western Bay project, and um, there's been a pretty good outcome delivered there. So we've we've managed to work through that as a bit of a pilot project and take some learnings from that. This paper just sets out how we plan to now roll this out to the rest of the regions, and we've made a few adjustments based on what we learned in the Western Bay in terms of our approach. So what we propose is that over the next three to six months, um, depending on, on how the engagement goes, is that we organise HUI with district councils and iwi representatives um, at a district-by-district district basis to talk through how we can scope up this project in each district. And the reason we're going that way um, first, instead of going to the Marae trustees first, like we did in Tauranga Moana, is what we really learned out of that project was we as the regional council might prompt this from the point of view of looking at wastewater and discharges, but we might not necessarily be the best to lead and deliver a project to actually resolve these, these situations. So we want to have that meeting up front with district councils and, and iwi to understand where they sit on the matter and to what level they can be involved, to what level they'd like to be involved. 
none of that is meant to take away from the fact that this is a marae centric project this will be working with marae trustees to deliver or to support them through um, getting their wastewater up to spec um, similarly uh, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that that in this paper we've suggested we meet with iwi representatives um, we're aware that it's not that simple. Uh, there are dynamics at play, and, and in each district and for different iwi and, and hapu, we will need to tailor an engagement strategy based on, on the relationships in there. So we'll be working with Katarina and her team to try and make sure that we get that initial engagement right at the right level to have a good, productive meeting that can then flow out to um, to speaking with Marae in the future, and we'll be bringing it back to, to this forum to talk about resourcing needed where, where our role is in that project. Um, so with that in mind, i um, happy to take any questions on this. Uh, Councillor MacDonald. Uh, kia ora. thank you for the report. Not so much a question, really. Um, I'm just a bit concerned at the approach that we're actually going to take this, um, taking the lessons that we've learned uh, from the Tauranga Moana experience. Um, the other thing I want to stress, too, that this initiative spawned from Committee Māori, so I yep. would hope that Committee Māori will be briefed as what has happened with the project that we initiated um, as a pilot for the whole region and where we were going to start um, in the Mowal constituency. Um, I've uh, been part of discussions with staff with the Western Bay and really I have to uh, give accolades to the Western Bay Plenty District Council uh, who really took up um, the challenge that we had expressed to ourselves around improving wastewater uh, effluent uh, facilities for marae. Um, I want to further acknowledge um, uh, their treatment of this whole project and their ability to access Crown funding uh, with the intention, uh, sole, uh, not uh, sole intention, with the intention of ensuring that there was contribution to this project as well as what they were requiring to improve in, the, in their wider community. So, you know, I just want to really take my hat off to the Western Bay. Um, my concern then around the um, uh, where you're looking to initiate um, uh, engagement and, and including iwi as you move across the region, I just want to make the, that you're looking to firstly discuss with uh, TLAs and acknowledge the importance of the TLAs having to take a role in this in these projects probably um, a lot greater than ourselves as regional council because of the re closer relationship they have on the ground with those specific marae. But my, my concern is the intent to speak with, uh, with iwi, and iwi and iwi leaders, as you say. I totally disagree with that approach. I, my, I think the approach should be directly with the marae. On this specific issue, it is an issue that will, in the first instance, be dealt by the marae, the marae and the marae committees. I also think it should be a simultaneous discussion that while you're having the discussions with TLAs at the same time, you are having the discussion with the marae. Because if you, if you start off with the TLAs, you're, then you're getting ahead of the game before the, the hapu are able to come on board. So if you, and you're acknowledging to the marae that you are having these simultaneous discussions, you will get better feedback and participation by them. It's an issue that they would want to take ownership of because it is about them. And so the initial discussions should, be, should not be in isolation of them. So I guess my... Uh, my advice is to staff is to take heed of that. Don't worry about the iwi at this stage because what we are trying to achieve, you know, we can take that information back to the iwi when we start to paint the bigger picture. But in the first instance here, you are dealing with the marae and a marae committee who reports back to a hapu. So that's my advice. Thank you, Councillor MacDonald. Your, your yeah, comments noted. Uh, Councillor White and then Eti. Councillor White. Um, yeah, kia ora, Mr Chair. 
Yeah, I totally support what Mati is saying. You can't sidestep the marae and the marae trustees. It's where it starts. And you're looking at 90-odd of 160-odd that mm, yep. may be not connected and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. Well, I can tell you it's likely to be worse than that. And it's dynamite because these marae, a lot of these marae that are in that state have been like that for years and are under-resourced and everything else. So you start going and if you're not careful and you go in with a big hammer, or I'm not suggesting we are going to, but tread very, very carefully. And the only way to do that is to connect with each of those marae and make sure that you're connecting with those trustees. Because if you're not, you know, you look at Whareidor and, and where they're at at the moment and really uh, protesting their situation. Well, you can multiply that many times in the context of complexities out there. Going across to East Bays, and I know Toy is going to probably make the point, over there you're going to get a lot of resistance to the space if you don't do it right. And you will not get them to budge, not respect, irrespective of whether they're consented or not you will have a bit of a battle on your hands. So just my note of caution, Mr. Chair. Caution noted. Thank you. Uh, Titaru Toy? Uh, kia ora, Chair, yeah, and I'm going to echo that caution. Okay. Um, from from the Kuhi constituency, you, you must go to the hapu and the marau. I, I know from our perspective it would be wonderful if we had one-stop shops and we could go to iwi, but um, there's the reality that, that post-settlement entities are not iwi, um, and neither are Runanga. Uh, and just to bring up to, to the rest of the councillors, a, uh, a particular issue around marae offset also is that marae go through a funding uh, process uh, with DIA and TPK, which is called the Marae Development Fund. Uh, part of that funding process is the first tranche of money that you get is to... Uh, do your planning and actually do your consenting based on your designs. Until you get that, you don't get the remainder of, oh, the, funding. Uh, of the funding. So you may be sitting on a consent for one, two, maybe three years before you actually build that offset. Um, I have brought this up to the, to the consents team uh, regarding that we actually start charging marae for monitoring of those offset that aren't actually in place and may not be in place for a number of years. Uh, so that is a unique situation to Marae uh, based upon that funding model. So I have brought that up to the team and uh, I think, and you've waived, waived those and if we put that into policy at all, we, and we have. So that's fantastic. That's um, a step in the right direction. Kia ora. One more, uh, um, Satya. The other thing I, I want to express is what we learned out of the Tauranga Moana uh, example, and it may help staff because um, I think we had internal capacity issues um, where we weren't able to keep this project moving as quickly as we had envisaged. And one of the things that was used in the Tauranga Moana space is that we had an independent, we had two independent contractors who did the 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 ground walking, I guess. And I think uh, their participation was of huge value because they were able to um, really interpret the discussions that they were having with the marae and then bring it back uh, to share with staff. So maybe that's another thing we should look at as well as having those independent contractors that could be having those discussions with the marae uh, while staff are having those discussions with the um with the TLAs. Thank you. Thank you. Those comments and uh, comments noted. There's a res any more questions? No. Um, there's a resolution on page 132 uh, that we received the report. Happy to move Councillor Nees, seconded by Councillor Rose, noting Alex and Sarah the comments that are made by our three constituency councillors. Uh, Hugely important. Councillor Brunning? I just wonder whether we could add a, a two there and just uh, commend the uh, Tauranga Moana, uh, Marae and the TAs and their work uh, that they're doing. It's not often that we sort of thank them. Councillor Nees, are you happy with that number two? Is Councillor Rose? Yep, cool. So it's just commending um, Tauranga on the work they're doing for Tauranga, Tauranga Moana work. Okay, I'll put that resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against, carried. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex.
Moving on to the, on page 138, the Mount Maunganui Industrial Airshed update. We're receiving the report. Who's going to, oh, this is Reese. No, it's not Reese. Stephen. And David. That's right. And David. Good morning. Maureen. Uh, through the chair, we'll take yep. it as read, although we do have one slide which David will speak to, which just clarifies 2.9.1, which is the genera limited oh, yep. paragraph. Yep. Oh, do you want to put that up now, please, Shari? And just while Shari's um, talking about it, Timaru Oil Services have appealed that it's now publicly out there that Timaru Oil Services have appealed that decision by the in commissioners. Yeah, right, go so. ahead, David. Good morning, councillors and chairman. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, David is my name. I'm a compliance officer based here in Mount Maunganui. Most of my work focuses on large industrial sites and uh, Genera's fumigation activities on the port. So uh, the yellow area marked on the map there was yeah. is called the Fumo Pad. It was originally established for the smaller log exporters that don't hold long-term leases on the port. Um, that location has proved somewhat problematic. While it does maintain 100 metres to the port boundary, which is a consent requirement, uh, it is very close to Tasman Quay, which is a major uh, traffic route through the, through the port. So that area has actually, from the 1st of January this year, has been disestablished, and that the fumigation activities that used to occur in that area have now been incorporated into the the apron along the port edge alongside the ships um, and through the center of the port where there is um, far less there's more separation to the eastern boundary there's more separation as well with the um, port traffic can you come and sh can, can you come and show us on the map, uh, please, David? So the the yellow is where they used to be, correct? And now they're going to. So the yellow area has been disestablished, and the fumigation activity can be anywhere through this area, or through the centre, right through here. So it's closer to the ships, whereas the port boundary, the um, eastern side of it, so Tasman Key, anybody on Tasman Key is an inducted port worker um, compared to the public road. Oh, that's um, Totra Street. Totra Street. Yeah. Yeah. Turn your mic on, please, Jane. Are the, are the treatment sites now more dispersed and, and not so concentrated? That, that's correct. Um, this area was always dedicated fumigation area while maintaining 100 metres to all port boundaries. So that area has been disestablished and just spread throughout the other area. Okay, we're just thinking about that. Councillor Rose, what do we think? <laughs> um, does, does the disestablishment of that particular area and now being spread out, spread out across that increase the risk of um, contamination towards any of the environment, both air and water? I understand we're talking air at the moment, but looking at where you've just pointed out the fumigation, that's... Like, it's literally near enough to the water that it could get into the water. So does this increase the risk in regards to environmental contamination? Uh, methyl bromide is a gas. So when uh, it's released to air, the tarp's taken off, it's discharged to air, there's no discharge to, to water. So in regards to air? Yeah. So is there a higher risk now 
that they've moved it to that small stroke of it contaminating air more. In, in my opinion, I don't believe so. Uh, the yellow area was disestablished because of the close proximity to the boundary, and the eastern boundary is closer to the public and closer to a lot of port traffic. So by moving it effectively out this side, um, it has got much more separation from the public and the prevailing westerly wind blows that way. So further separation would be an advantage. Yeah. Yeah, go on. Sarah? And just through the chair, um, you'll remember that we've got a process in front of the Environmental Protection Authority at the moment with a lot of modelling in place to better understand um, what kind of boundaries might be required um, for all fumigation activities. And we are looking really closely at that modelling and waiting for that to come out to guide our own decisions. And uh, can I just refer you to page 143 in terms of the recapture, 80% of the gas recaptured. And um, so just, yeah. Councillor White, you're thinking? I was thinking. But anyway, I'll just catch up with what Sarah's just said. I think it's critical for us to be have that report before us, um, having just seen the previous um, report from Balance in terms of the difference of the prevailing winds being able to counter the flow of dust, then this being a gas, oh, you would you would argue it's got a similar streak to it in terms of effect of uh, the weight, the directions of the wind and prevailing winds. That's correct, and and that dispersion modelling is really important. Um, and the community are asking lots of questions about what will it mean at different wind um, speeds on different wind directions, whether you might be Fariroa or whether you're the residential areas in the mount. So that's very important modelling that's to come. And remember, this is on page 143 again, 343. 45 submissions received. And have the commissioners been appointed yet? With the generic consent? I'll have to get back to you on that. That's a good question. Councillor McDonald, yes, I did have you down, sorry. I just have an issue about you saying that, that um, moving it because, did you say because the population is more the other side? Yeah, a greater population the other side? Did you, did you mention? Did you say that? No, it was. It was one of the gone. reasons why you. It was. It was. It had a minimum of a hundred meters separation to the port boundary, which is almost that line right there. Their boundary is actually Kiwi Rail. Okay. okay, so that's their boundary that they have to do their monitoring on. So the minimum requirement under the consent was a hundred meters, but when they moved down the than 100 metres. There was a lot of uh, port workers on the port through the offices, etc. here, whereas over here, I guess there's less, um, less public in this area. So do you, yeah. so do you envisage a further expansion? Yeah. Um, we we are actually working with Genera right now um, to formulate a plan which identifies exactly the areas that fumigation can occur within the port, taking into account the required buffer zones. Um, I think that's going to be quite important. They are very constrained in terms of what areas they can fumigate. Uh, I think there is real value in establishing dedicated fumigation zones. Um, one of the key components you've got to protect people is signage. So if we have dedicated areas where there's limited access, uh, I think that provides a safety buffer. Okay. Hey, Mr. Chair, if I may, yeah. just very briefly, Go just reminding, just reminding me that this is a gas that is, that's very extremely difficult to contain. <laughs> you know, so there are so many parameters that 
that is, it, 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 to me, it carries a pretty high risk. We better get the solution right. And the location doesn't look all that attractive to me. That's my personal opinion. Thank you. Thank you, David. And I, I um, asked for the team to put up a map for us to where the uh, new site was going to, because I, I couldn't understand the, um, the the words at the moment. So now we know. Councillor Thompson? How were they allowed to move? The area that they were fumigating in, the yellow fumigation pad, um, is authorised under the consent. They were allowed to fumigate in that area. Um, it's an initiative between the Port of Tauranga and Genera to move it to a safer location. And this is under the new consent that they're applying for now. Is that the new site for the new consent? They haven't shifted yet. This is under the old consent. Oh, oh so they're operating there now? Yes. Councillor Thompson? No. Okay. Thank you, David, for bringing it to our attention. Um, is there anything else on the Mount Maunganui Industrial Airshed update? Any other questions? Councillor Love? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, I'm referring to page 140, item 2.1. I, I was at a, 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 a private meeting where I was buttonholed by two CEOs of major companies in the in the Mount Monganui area. And they were saying, following a meeting, I'm not quite sure who it was organised by, but certainly a representative of the regional council apparently stated, uh, and uh, I'm, this is all secondhand, but apparently stated that, that it was the firm intention of the regional council to remove all industry from that area. I would hope that is not the case. I would hope that what our intention is, is, is to remove those industries who are unable or do not wish to put in proper controls to, to prevent pollution. Uh, and I would like an assurance that it is not the intention of the council uh, to stop all industry in that area, as it is an area which is vital to the economy both of Tauranga, to the workforce of Tauranga, and also of New Zealand. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Love. Councillor McDonald. Thank you, Mr Chair. I think the Councillor's comments were out of order. It's come from a fire private conversation, and he is inferring. Um, obviously, I am one of those representatives at those meetings that no doubt the conversation and, and what he has spoken is absolute rubbish. Absolute rubbish. And I'm quite happy for anybody to approach any industrial representative, any, any tongue of the funeral rep in there, and even Councillor Thompson, who attended the last, that I have ever given that kind of statement in there. Uh, because no doubt they are referring to me. And that is absolute rubbish. And the, and the mere fact that he's allowed to bring comment here from a private discussion, I think, is out of order. Thank I you. I totally agree. And I am enraged that such a comment would be allowed to be made at this meeting without first checking with the two representatives who have been at those meetings. If I may, Mr Chairman? No. In that point, in that case, I see no point in me continuing at this meeting. I reject entirely the comments made by Matt Luana and Paula Thompson. Thank you. Can we move Chairman, on with the... Just uh, point of order. Uh, yeah, there, there, point of correct order. me if I'm wrong, and I seek the wisdom of Councillor Thompson as an ex-CEO and TLAs and... Um, Councillor Crosby, but there is a mechanism by which we can have those comments struck yeah. from the minutes. Correct me if I'm wrong. If, if so, I'm happy to move. Um, can I ask if, if you're referring to the comments that were made by Councillor Love that I would certainly second that? Correct. There is a mechanism and understanding orders that we can have those words struck from the minutes. 
I'll leave that to lie on the table till we get it checked out. Yeah, I mean, no, you haven't brought a point of order. I mean, I no, just, no, I'm just I'm seeking your direction, Chairman. So. Yeah, I mean, under a point of order, there is a request that minutes recorded any words that have been subject to an objection that we can... Um, have them struck from the minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm happy to move in that direction, Chairman, if that's the wish no, I have of the meeting. And I have second that, Mr Chair. Just dealing with that point of order, um, I'll put it. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. It's carried. Okay, thank you. Uh, can we move on to the... Any other issues on the uh, Mount Maunganui Industrial Airshed update? There's a, a, a report that report be received. Do I have a mover? Thank you. So moved, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Thurston. Seconder, Councillor Nees. Any further discussion? All those in favour, please say aye. Thank you. Motion is carried. And moving on to the next item, which is the Climate Change Program Update, page 150. And I've got Laverne. Good morning. No, good afternoon. And Chris. So uh, you've got the update there. Laverne, over to you. Morning, councillors. Good morning, Chair. Um, yes, I'd like to offer the um, report to be taken as read and I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Any questions on the climate change? Councillor Nees? Um, just, just a clarification, are we updating our action plan? Through you, Chair, yes, um, Councillor Nees, that is part of the um, connection to the goals that yes. you'll see in the columns next to it. Those goals are specifically in the action plan. And that's the update of the actions taking place in the action plan. Right, no, the, our first version of the action plan, as I recollect, it was all about getting our house in order. And we've signalled through our discussions for the long-term plan that we wanted more external focus. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that we are updating our action plan um, because I thought we were going to get another version through for us to have a look at. Um, to, to pick up some of the um, the collaborative work that we um, apparently are doing. I know Tiara have got a climate change strategy and Fakatani have signed off on theirs and I'd really like to see that we're getting alignment um, and we're working together to try and get some consensus as to the actions we, uh, that are going to be taken across the whole region. So if you could just clarify that and also how... Um, any response from our climate change statement is going to be fed through into our updated action plan. So the focus to date has been on preparing the position statement that has now been released as part of the long-term plan consultation. And then, of course, we're expecting to see submissions from the public through the consultation over the next um, month or two. Um, so... At the moment, the climate change program work doesn't include a change to the action plan. We've just been adding all of the work programs together into the, under the auspices of the new program. But if that is something councillors wish us to do, that's certainly something we can do. Please forgive me. I, I thought that we had been told that we were going to see that, that the action plan was being updated and that we were going to see if, uh, an update to it. And then the discussion on the statement, um, position statement popped up, but that didn't alter my expectation that the action plan was an action plan at a point of time that had actions that were focused very much on us getting a house in order and we must be progressing well through that now. So I'm still expecting, and forgive me if I've got the wrong idea or the wrong end of the stick, but I'm still expecting an update so that we've got visibility as to what the work action plan work program is going forward. Yes, thank you, Councillor Nunez. Um, I think that the, the possible confusion is coming in where um, this report is covering both continued work through the action plan as well as the new work that, is, that has been assigned to us in terms of um, the external work is the adaptation planning and the risk assessment planning. Yes. We're working with our partners in that. Um, since the, the 
workshop that we had in October in Tepuki. We've subsequently had three um, technical working group meetings. The last one was last week. And that's progressing the regional risk assessment work, which is all tied into the program. So the pro program's incorporating the action plan work, which was the house and order stuff, that's continuing. And it's got an internal perspective as well as some external, as well as the new work that was um, put along. The consultation work that's coming through the LTP and the responses to that will be incorporated into the program to continue pulling together the work that's taking place. We're trying to use the approach of, and this report is the first reflection of that, to show what's happening in our business as usual world, what's happening in the program um, with our external partners, as well as the action plan. So not putting any of them to bed, but continuing reporting in one forum. Denise, you happy? Still iterate that I would like to see an updated action plan after we've received the um, feedback on our position statement and heard from our public as to what they would like us to be doing. Councillor Crosby. Just briefly, it's good to see the focus also on um, adaptation uh, as well, and I do agree it's, it's layered. I think that's what you were trying to say, you know, the layered approach. And I, I support Council on these that, uh, particularly from a public optics perspective, we need to understand what we're doing in terms of constant improvement, not business as usual. But we do need the public to understand that actually for a long, long time in the adaptation space, a lot's been happening and that's often forgotten about. And also, you know, some of the jobs for nature stuff and all that starting to come through very helpful as well. So I think structurally it's right. It's probably, um, we'll have to wait and see what our response is from the um, LTP consultation and then have a have another have another look to make sure that it is laid correctly and the right information is in there. But, you know, big improvement from it. Thank you, Councillor White. And just to follow on uh, to what Councillor Nees has said, I, um, you know, we all know that in, a couple of years ago we announced the climate change emergency. We took some some knocks about how uh, that we weren't really doing much about it. I noticed our internal uh, audit work says that our overall rating was adequate. <laughs> but the, the lights go on when I see the word adequate and I see the word emergency. They don't quite marry. Um, and so um, I, I just like to think there might be a bit of stretch or are we just taking a sort of a slower platform before we, we start accelerating upward here? Uh, because, you know, I just came back from the local government, New Zealand, um, a symposium on climate change uh, with, with Jane and uh, Stacey attended. And quite frankly, it was rather dull. Like, you know, oh. it was it was quite dull, <laughs> and I think it was adequate. But then again, you know, there's no stretch in the thinking. And I think, you know, from my perspective, I'd like to see some stretch, and maybe it's that updated action plan that Councillor Nees is looking for. Uh, yeah, respond, please, Councillor. <laughs> <For that. laughs> I'll pass that on. <laughs> is that D? Is that dull with a big D or a little D? <laughs> Pretty big D. <laughs> I wasn't there, so I can't help that. Um, just a little bit of information that came up in order and risk too about um, how we can measure some of this difference. So I have passed on uh, to the CEO um, uh, an initiative by local government New Zealand through uh, a major consultancy company called, um, which I've just forgotten. Uh, anyway, you know, I pass it on to the CEO. It's being trialled in New Plymouth and Queenstown. And um, it could be an opportunity uh, how we can actually measure the difference of these You mean the local government CEO or our CEO? Oh, OK. Yep. Oh, McDermott, sorry, was the name of the company. Yeah. Any further questions, discussion on our climate change program update? And Jane, yeah, I mean, I think it's part of our LTP. We'll re refine it and um, await for communities' uh, submissions and we'll go from there. But yeah. uh, Could I just make one other comment? I, d I didn't want to sound overly critical. I really appreciate the enhanced reporting that you provided us, and I think it's it's excellent. Um, so, so please don't. Um, 
uh, take it to heart. Um, but it is a matter very dear to my heart. And I really want um, us to have a clear program of action that we can share with our community. So that's um, where my comments are coming from. Um, so I'm happy to move, Mr Chair, and thank you, staff. Thank you. So that's moving on page 150, Jane. The uh, receive the report. Do I have a second? Councillor White, any further discussion? I'll put that all those in favour, please say aye. Against carried. Moving on to customer service performance uh, presented by Rachel Burgess and Matt Taylor. Hello. Hi, Rachel. Hi, everybody. This is on page 158. It's nice to see you all again and um, provide an update today on our customer service performance. Um, so we've been on our service improvement journey uh, for two years now, and during that time we've implemented a number of new initiatives um, that have provided some tangible results in terms of an improved um, service delivery. Um, so some of the highlights that I've included in the report today, uh, we've had our CRM system in place now for seven months, um, and during that time the team have generated and resolved 26,000 service tickets. Um, we ha are now achieving a 97% resolution rate at the first point of contact, um, compared to a pretty dismal 43% uh, uh, when we first started out on this journey. Um, so that's a pretty significant achievement. Um, the call centre are now managing all of our business activity calls. Um, in the 12 months that the call centre has been operational, um, we've received a total of 45,000 calls, um, and this is up 28% on the previous year. Um, call wait times have reduced substantially, uh, within, with the team answering 92% uh, of calls within 20 seconds. Um, so you'll remember that uh, one of the uh, big changes that we implemented was to remove the calls from our front desks, and this is, has been the, you know, the result of, of that decision has resulted in um, this great improvement. Um, the Bay Bus queries make up about 40% of our total call volumes now. Um, and we have also integrated a component of our Zendesk CRM system um, within the Baybust website um, to improve web search functionality. Um, so this now includes an answer bot um, that can automatically answer common queries um, and uh, uh, the system knows when to involve a, an agent for a more technical response. Um, our visitor numbers also increased during 2020 um, despite the COVID lockdown, um, and this is, was largely due to the regional integrated ticketing system and implementation. Um, so moving forward, we're now focused on monitoring and measuring our delivery, um, and this includes targeted customer feedback and mystery shopping um, reporting. Um, so just in response to the question that um, you answered earlier, Councillor Crosby, um, there's a number of ways that we are now collecting data and we can now interrogate that data. Um, so we know we've got 45,000 calls coming in, we've got 12,000 visitors to our um, offices and we've got about 3 million bus passengers so what better way to actually get the feedback from our customers our customers directly when they're using those services um, so we've been doing um, uh, the monitoring and measuring in small pockets um, leading up to now but now that we have the systems in place to better in interrogate that uh, we want to be able to um, survey our customers while they're using um, our services so um, Ways that we can do that, for example, is um, introducing call recording so we can actually go back and listen to the calls um, to find out if a customer was unha unhappy, what were the issues in terms of resolving that um, query for them. Um, we can also um, capture our complaints and customers uh, compliments in the system so we can actually identify some of the things that we're doing really well and expand on those and continue to do them. Um, and. Uh, and, and I believe the most effective way that we can do this is actually um, in our call closing. So as we've got those 45,000 customers on the call, we're actually asking them at the end of the call, are they happy with the service they've received? Is there anything else we can do to help them? That type of thing. I'm happy to take any further questions. Rachel, the, all, so the pollution hotline, um, 0800 five knots, all comes through to our own call centre. It's all those sorts of things. All the calls that we previously had managed by external suppliers yep. are now in-house. Yep. In-house. Very good. Councillor Crosby, Knees, and then Clark. 
Thank you for that. And um, mm. some time ago, I, I used to spend time in a call centre. It's absolutely fascinating. <laughs> and the uh, amount of information that um, you have at your disposal is phenomenal. So once you've got the data um, and you could see a trend happening that might require an adjustment in a, in a policy or a procedure or some action, what happens? We add that to our training program so that it um, is a, is a flow-on effect really. So we don't just want to capture that change just within our call centre. We want it to be implemented across all bus business activities that have contact with with customers. Um, and we also do, in terms of the call recording and the mystery shopping, we actually do a briefing with that agent after that call to actually take them through the feedback of how they might have done really well or how they could improve as well. So you're, you're collecting all the calls and the data and you're, you're detecting that a policy might need to change here not in your team, but something is not operating like it should do in terms of servicing their customers. You know, do you go back to the manager of the team, you know, possibly someone like Sarah, if it's a regulatory thing, and say, we're detecting this, this is an issue Right. Okay. Yep. No, I've yeah. got you. Yeah. Okay. So that's um, where we've uh, put together the customer collaboration network. So that involves representatives across all the different business activities in the council. So um, each of those um, business activity representatives can either get that feedback directly to relay to that team, but they're also aware of what's happening across other teams as well to make sure that they're keeping up with consistent changes. Uh, Councillor Nees and then Clark. Thank you. Um, I think it was um, Councillor Thompson at our last meeting asked if a customer service request app, app could be developed. Is that something in your purview or is that something that the t um, IT staff are working on? Customer service request. So that's where someone externally can... Has, has got an issue that they want us to check out. Um, I think other councils use it, and I think that was a request that was made. All right, Antino, is, is that the program? Yep. Um, yeah, so we have Antino. We also belong to Antino, uh, which is a community-based app that people can directly log into and, and, and lodge a, a query using that app directly. And um, we also have the web info forms on our website um, and then you know people can call us which obviously remains our most popular mode of contact. Okay thank you. Um, through the chair uh, the pollution prevention team are also looking at a specific app that people might be able to log pollution events that links up to the um, the customer system um, so that we can respond immediately and we are looking into that. Yep. Uh, my further question is around emails. Um, that just come into the organisation at many points from people that aren't happy about one thing or another. And I'm sure many councillors like me get emails um, frustrated um, because they've had a point of contact with council and it hasn't actually delivered their expectation. And many of, it, of those are about, um, I don't know what's happening. Um, you know, they've perhaps uh, rung, had a complaint, somebody's come out and had a look at it's something and then it's gone away and the loop's not closed. Um, and what I tend to do is just pass it over to the appropriate GM and ask that, you know, the loop, that it be investigated and the loop be closed and I be kept in the loop. But to me, it's, it's still an area that we're not that good at. Um, so I guess my question is, how can we do better in that area? So through you, the Chair. Um, I think the CRM remains our most valuable tool in this space and, and it's proved um, in the several months that we've had it that it really is closing that gap so people can't fall through the craps, uh, crack if they contact us with a query. Um, and so what we have in progress now is actually rolling out the CRM to the wider organisation so that everybody is using the same system. So it means once a service ticket is generated, whether it be a query or a complaint or a compliment or whatnot, it actually can't be closed until it's been resolved and then closed off. What you're telling me is that the CRM isn't embedded right across the organisation yet, but it will be. It's in progress, yes, yeah. at the moment. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Clark. 
Uh, yeah, a bit of a statement followed by a question. Firstly, um, the Pollution Hotline, what a fabulous service. The positiveness, it's well advertised, it's constantly on in the media. Um, and having tested the service a couple of times, works extremely well. But So all compliments to you guys. But a um, question to Stuart, how do we, as a local body, get the government to empower our pollution hotline people and those people to actually get more teeth into it because often a lot of these complaints are only sorted with a little warning and a slap on the wrist because there is no power, there is no teeth. So I would think that through LGNZ we should be empowering our people to be able to um, get into the guts of this. Quickly, through you, Mr Chair, that's been front of mind uh, for a number of years now under the our Local Government Act, if I get it right, um, we're very limited in what we can do for fines under $1,000. And this, the default position is taking people to court. And that's highly expensive, quite confrontational, and it's a lose-lose situation often and costs the ratepayers an absolute fortune. So we've been asking the Minister to, um, through regulation, uh, put in a, a range of other options once the niceties have finished, to empower local government uh, to have a fine regime, very similar to getting a traffic ticket, which you can't, we can't do at the moment. It's either nothing, really, or go to court. And it's very frustrating not to have that full range of options available to the officers. Working on it. OK, no further questions. Um, thank you, Rachel. Uh, there's a resolution on page 158. We receive the report. Keep up the good work. You can see that um, uh, councillors see this as, um, you know, what we do, and um, we get it in the neck if we don't, if the collective of, of us don't do it right. But uh, keep up the good work, and we continue to monitor your um, your performance. So thank you very much. And um, would somebody like to move the report on page 158, please? Thank you, Councillor Nee, seconded by Mr White, Councillor White. Any further discussion? I'll put that resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. Against carried. Um, update on Kaimai Mamaku, and then we'll break for lunch. Mr De Montchor. good morning. No, good afternoon. De Monchi. Good morning, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and councillors. Thank you for the opportunity to provide you with an update. Yep. Um, I've got about six bullet points to just um, provide the highlights of the report yep. and then um, open it up for questions. So, as you'll recall, um, council put $1.5 million towards Kaimo Mamaku Peace Control starting 1 July 2019, and that was through the Tauranga harbour activity. Um, so prior to that date, annual agency funded pest control work in the Kaimai Mamaku was about $134,000 per year. Um, so now with uh, plus about half a million dollars worth of care group and volunteer activity. So that, that was over and above the agency funded work. Um, in the last year and a half, we have worked with DOC um, the Manaki Kaimai Mamaku Trust, chaired by Councillor Brunning, um, Waikato Regional Council and others, and put together that Towards Thriving Kaimai Mamaku Agreement, um, which was a focus on three, three main projects. Um, and that has led to an environmental program being signed um, with, a, with an action plan that's now led to the doubling of agency-funded pest control being in place. And so the attachment to the paper gives you a bit of an update on operations year to date under that environmental program. Um, if you want to see some more, you know, there's some examples, you know, 176 goats have been shot in the Kaimais um, under this additional funding and the recent um, Opuiaki rodent and predator control operation um, just south of State Highway 29 has received a 0% rodent tracking success rate after the bait stations were filled. So um, prior to the operation, around about half the tunnels had rat tracks in them. And after the operation, um, none of the tunnels had rat tracks in them. So that was good. Um, we have a program manager in place, uh, 
which is contracted through the department with some co-funding from ourselves through that fund. That's uh, Tim Day. Some of you will have seen or heard of him through the Wallabies program as well. Is that the Tim Day from the Tarawera Ultra Marathon? Does it, is he do? Correct, yeah. Oh, right, yep, same Tim Day. He sold that race um, franchise, I think, recently, which has given him some capacity ah. to focus more on biodiversity work. Uh, obviously, the second major source of funding in this area is the Department of Conservation's Jobs for Nature uh, $19 million announcement, um, which, which dwarfs the Regional Council's contribution. And it's fair to say that that has taken a little while to go from an announcement to work on the ground. Um, I've detailed a few of the so-called quick start projects, which have just started um, in the ranges through that funding. And Councillor Brunning may wish to provide you with an update on how the Manaki Kaimai Mamaku Trust has restructured itself and may play a significant role in administering that funding on an ongoing basis. Brunning? Uh, thank you, uh, Pim. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, yes, the Kaimai, uh, Manaki Kaimai Mamaku Trust, which was formed uh, 15 months ago, um, has agitated and, and came out of the Kama Mamaku Forum for further funding from uh, government. Um, one of the benefits of the COVID uh, situation has been that the $19 million uh, has come from Jobs for Nature to be spent in the Kama Mamaku over the next four years. And uh, it was perceived that the trust that was formed wasn't quite fit for purpose. Um, and uh, so it is restructuring itself so that we will have six iwi representatives and five community representatives with the co-chairing uh, between um, uh, Tang Whenua and, and the community um, situa situation. We're working closely with DOC and DOC in Wellington to uh, get to a position where um, the trust can largely um, administer or have influence over this $19 million, um, which is a considerable amount of money uh, to be spent in four years. So there's a lot of other things that will flow out of that. And um, there are a lot of alliances to be developed. Um, and we had the uh, Bay Conservation Alliance this, here this morning. And I, it, just my vision, and this is a personal vision at the moment, is that we will work with uh, them and the community groups uh, within the forest and outside the forest uh, to uh, enhance the, the concept of mountains to the seas. And um, I look forward, uh, I have been um, selected, uh, uh, we had to go through a selection process to get the, the new trustees and I and two others on the present trust of, of going forward to this enlarged trust. Um, and the chairs will be selected uh, from that trust when it uh, is formulated in about four weeks' time. We've had a, a bit of a delay, but um, we are trying our best um, to uh, work with, with Hapu Iwi, and they will be a key um, in more ways than one in uh, getting the program up and running, engaging with them, employing um, iwi hapu um, people. I would envisage getting the, some of those people trained through the Bay Conservation Alliance, et cetera, uh, because um, as you saw in that uh, video that was put up um, by Michelle this morning, um, the ownership that was starting to happen with those people and the realisation, some people finding their own selves within the program, um, you know, it's going right through to this ownership um, of um, the whenua, um, Maori Pākehā and, you know, even solving mental health issues. So I think there are going to be huge, huge spin-offs in this, not just in the forest, um, but um, in the capacity of people to um, be involved. So that's a brief summary. I could go on for ages. <laughs> Thank you, Norm. Oh, congratulations of getting on that trust. We we um, wish you well. We're watching your progress. Yeah.
Any other questions for Pim, uh, Councillor Nees? Thank you. Um, I think we, we on an earlier presentation, we were told that there were some areas that traditional pest management um, techniques will not um, reach um, and that we need perhaps be needing to look at sort of broader scale um, solutions. And I heard something on the news last week whereby there was a research study of a um, 1080 um, uh, program which had not affected the nat native birds at all. Um, so my question is, what is the thinking within the trust and um, within our staff and DOC um, within this program on the use of 1080 um, to get a wider reach for pest management? We have one of the hubs um, in the Kaimau Mamaku that uses 1080 with the approval of uh, iwi. Um, so that hopefully will be a catalyst in, in having those discussions. They're, they're discussions that have to be heard. Um, from my Pākehā perspective, I've, I've questioned how do you engage with Māori and understand the concerns they have around 1080 and um, I've had it sort of explained to me that it's um, you don't use poisons, um, but if you've got nothing else at the end of the day and you've had a good quarter uh, you might have to get the rat trap out, and in this case, 1080. So if, if we can engage truly and effectively with these communities, and if we, um, say, took a, a, a busload of sceptics down to the... Um, Furunaki or down down the East Cape here to the um, uh, Raukumaras. Uh, if you've seen the video, and, and you, I encourage you to find the video of what has happened in the Raukumaras, and they've got about $43 million from this fund to do work down there, but, boy, have they got some work to do. Um, so when you show them how bad it is in those areas, I think um, that will be just part of the education um, because there will be areas where you cannot even climb up the climbers up behind Caddy Caddy, those high steep cliffs and that sort of thing, where 1080 will be the only answer. You cannot tramp the whole climber with mammacoos. Could I just for uh, make it a support Clark. statement? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mentioned Furunaki Norm simply because if you go to Ngāti Whare who, who were persuaded to go across the line with 1080 and now four years later, the results they are having, they are actually poking their tongues at Tuhoi, whose forest is getting devastated and Nati Forest is coming up. And so there's a... I would like uh, that trigger from the record. Councillor Clark, <laughs> yes. Uh, Councillor White. Yeah, thanks, uh, Councillor. Um, the, uh, the comments you, you made about um, if all else fails, after the corridor, then you know, do what you have to do. And I think it just shows that that Iwi can be very pragmatic when the when push comes to shove. To be blunt, um, look, I'm just wanting a question to Pim around. Uh, I'm looking at a, a diagram here with with shows all the different curls, and you've got all it's it's beset with all of these yellow dots which represent goat bills. You mentioned 179 goats. In the context of the goat population, what does that look like in the context? Are you Part way there? Are you a long way there, or what is the story? Because this goat spread is right across that domain. Yeah, I, I, when when these kinds of questions come up, um, I, I think it's it's always more important how many you leave behind than it is how many you <laughs> killed. Um, and and unfortunately, you you're never quite sure um, with with goats. So what what we use in this case is a um, kills per hunter day effort as an index of how hard they are to find which gives us a kind of, you know, if you're killing 10 goats a day, then obviously there's lots and lots of goats, and you can usually see that in the ecological monitoring. Our aim uh, with the department through this Towards Thriving Kaima Mamaku project is to get the um, density of goats down so that it, you're killing, on average, around about 0.5 of a goat per hunter day of effort um, through a sustained hunting period, and that could be ramped up to zero density but that would require a significant um, increase in resourcing, which which is potentially possible through the Jobs for Nature program. So if you look at the um, 
So the map that's being referred to is on page 177 of your yep. agenda. Yep. And I think um, there's a table following. Um, it's on page 180. Yeah, I think so. We're still in the one to two goats per effective day of hunting uh, at the moment. So we've still got some way to go to bring that density down to where we'd want it. But I would say that would be more than three quarters of the goats in that area, whether it's you know 97 percent or whether it's 87 percent. I, I don't know, but but somewhere up in that top end of the proportion of goats that were in the area before. So is the ultimate target elimination or getting it just down to a particular sustainable level? At, at the moment, um, the there is no official elimination target that's been set down. Um, the, the department's effort in this area had been trickling along at about $30,000 per year, which wasn't enough even to stop the, um, the range of goats from expanding or the number of goats um, increasing. So that wasn't, it wasn't even enough to maintain them at their current level. The current funding through this environmental program, about $90,000 per year is going into goat control and that will be enough to stop the feral range from expanding further and it will be enough to bring goat density down to that 0 0.5 goats per hunter day effort threshold which will allow the native plants in the understory to respond if we want to then go the next step of eradication or elimination or in this context it's probably better to call it maintaining zero density because you can't eliminate eradication i mean a reinvasion um, then we would bring in a program where we used a lot of radio tagged so-called Judas goats to track down their mates and continually revisit them um, to try and get right down. But the, the cost per goat, um, you know, the last few goats are going to cost the most, most money. So if that's identified as a priority um, through the Jobs for Nature funding, then it's achievable. Um, I think also just to refer back to Councillor Nees's question about 1080, one of the principles that's been applied to this Kaumai Mamaku biodiversity planning space is that the decision making and prioritisation should be done at a hub level, so at a hapu catchment, you know, local care group community level, rather than making one decision for the whole ranges. And so what's right for um, you know, the Whakamarama area might not be right for Mokaihaha, which is the place where regular triennial annual 1080 operations are already um, underway. Okay, thank you, Pim. So, any further questions on the Kaima Mamaku? Councillor McDonald. Turn your mic on. Staff? Yeah, just, I just want to acknowledge the work that's been done by staff, um, uh, Pim, and, Pim and others. And really to Councillor Norm Brunning, um, really just the, um, the example of where they've arrived at a governance entity is, is um, superb. Yeah, yeah, superb. Yeah, superb. And, and uh, yeah, yeah, I was wanting to be better than good. Yeah, superb. And, you know, it's... it's uh, it's a light to where we're trying to take to take us. So I just want to say, um, you know, great stuff, Norm, because I knew there, I knew about the challenges in there, including around the Hapuwi relations, which I still understand are still slightly strange. But um, to get them to the point, and yourself to the point, we are now sitting together in that um, uh, joined up entity. I think is brilliant. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor uh, McDonald. Yeah, well said. Okay, there's a resolution on page 166 that we received the board. Councillor Thurston, seconded by Councillor White. Yeah, uh, Pim, before you go, uh, you invited us to the Kaituna diversion opening up of the 12th gate or something like that. Um, we never got there because something happened. Don't can't remember what it was. So the 12 gates opening properly and everything's working in accordance with plan down at the Kaituna Division? Yes, and my apologies to councillors for the late invitation. It was a, a very low-key affair, um, 12 months on from opening nine of the gates. Yep. Um, we were allowed under the consent conditions to go full bore and open all of them. Yep. 
and it was it was quite impressive. And the yeah, the the results that we were anticipating um, are being achieved. So it's looking good. Oh, good to hear. Good to hear. Okay, resolutions being moved and seconded on page 166. All those in favour, please say aye. Against carried. Thank you. We'll adjourn for lunch, and we're back here at. Quarter past one. Okay, we'll resume the meeting and we're on page 181. This is the Environment Code, Environmental Code of Practice for Rivers and Drainages Maintenance Activities, the Annual Review. Uh, Mr Ingle, welcome along, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr Chair. This is, uh, well, apologies first from Bruce Crabb, who's not well today. Um, he's asked me if I could cover this. I, I understand it's, um, it's not a new thing. The Code of Practice uh, is a requirement of the permitted activity rule in the regional plan that allows rivers and drainage to carry out their everyday works. Um, so one of the key things of that requirement is that we report to the council annually on um, the performance of the code. Uh, and so this report is um, intended to satisfy that. I think the main part probably is the number of complaints we've received. So we've attached that as appendix three or attachment three. Uh, I note there have been eight complaints uh, lodged or written complaints at least out of, I think, 1,200 activities. So personally, I see that as a, a fairly low number. But the, of course, the main thing is that we resolve those complaints as they come up and make sure they don't happen again. So that's the intention. If I could take it as read, councillors, and I'll try hey, to answer Engel. questions. And Chris, I was going to ask Bruce this question, but since we adopted the uh, Rivers and Drainage Bylaw Review, uh, any of the complaints related to that because it's been operative since 1st of February, I think, Norm, was that we went live. Um, have we had any feedback from the drainage and bylaw review? Councillor Clark, are you uh, responding to that question? Uh, yep, I've had a bit of feedback from those good folks in Henderson Street and Fukutani, the ones that have got barbecues and swimming pools and gardens all growing into the stock bank and they've kind of wondering but we've had these here for years what are they going to do I mean one chap rang up and gave me quite an earful and I said so when the nice man comes along with his digger to take out your barbecue doesn't look like he's going to get a cup of tea at your place does he <laughs> and he actually laughed at that but yeah yeah um yeah th there is uh of course, there's feedback on that. I mean, it's um, particularly in the Edgham context and the Fokatani context where there's an enormous amount of encroachment into stock bank areas that have occurred over time. And as things happen, I would say I've probably fielded five or six queries from Fokatani, but were they going to complaints? They just simply wanted to know and was able to actually explain to them and everybody's kind of aware of where the boundaries are and stuff like that but I mean if that's the context of our, you know um, yeah, settling into these new bylaws um, particularly in the urban sense um, really we're at the beginning of it and it's going to take a couple of years to get through to it I did explain just so you know that if the council is not seen to be proactive and actually enforcing the bylaw then we step Potentially, we stand to lose um, the support of our insurers should uh, a major event come and explain that that context. People sort of got over it, but they, you know, that's what we do out in the political field, particularly as having been part of the commission that um, wrote and put the bylaws in place. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Uh, thank you, Chris. Are there any further questions on this? Uh, Councillor White? Yeah, I just noticed, you know, you're, you're talking here around 37 Iwi Apu management plans, Chris, and, um, you know, that's that's always a, a point of tension. An example of that is the Ngāti Awa and the Ngāti Mākino management uh, uh, plans. Um, and so I guess, you know, this is um, an area uh, that uh, will create some difficulties in, in a point of time. Is, are you encountering that at the moment? Oh, <laughs> There are a couple of areas where um, there is um, uncertainty, I guess, on on who has the 
Bana Whenua are over a particular reach of riverbed, and there's one um, that Councillor Ehi's familiar with uh, that hasn't been resolved yet, even though that happened, I think, oh, over a year ago. So, you know, we just tend to be patient and work with the communities. I think there's been a Marae visit up, up the top there just recently, so um, we'll just wait till things sort out. Usually it's to do with minor river works like uh, willow layering and things like that. So they don't have to be done urgently, but we do take it seriously that we want to be working alongside the correct iwi o hapu. Uh, Matt, Mr Chair, maybe just a comment to Council Eti here that um, all the operational works up in Tuhoi have halted pending some further discussions with the Tūru Taumatua group. Have you got any comment on that, uh, Councillor Uti, just for interest's sake, about some of these tensions that are out there? Sure. Thank, thank you, um, Councillor White. Um, it is the same situation that we were talking about with the OSET uh, and that post-settlement entities. This is the reality of living in a, a post-settlement world. Um, where you corporatise one Z when you go through a settlement process and all of the assets are transferred to an entity who uh, sometimes can purport to have more influence over hapu than they actually do have. Um, and that's in statute. If you look at the uh, Tuhoi Settlement Act, it is very clear in its definition of who Tuhoi is. Uh, and that is the uh, collective, the individuals who are housed within that collective, and the Fano and Hapu who house those individuals. Uh, if you look at our relationship protocols, uh, the definition of Tuhoi suddenly shifts and becomes Te Uru Matua. That inconsistency is an issue. There's also a clause within the Act uh, that states that any protocols that are in place are subject to the Act themselves. So, excuse me, I'm catching my breath. I've been running around for lunch, <laughs> doing some banking. Um, therefore, yeah still some money there. Um, therefore, you know, we must act legally. We, we're statutorily obliged. But this is also, we also have to take care of relationships. We don't want to stand on anybody's toes. So it's um, the same thing, I think, in all of our constituencies, these kinds of uh, uh, landscapes that we must navigate. So um, like uh, Chris said, we have had a meeting up at uh, one of the hapu who have uh, officially said that they are not representative by Te Uru Taumatsua within Tuhoi. Um, we must provide for their relationship with the awa and having staff back there for the first time since we were asked to remove ourselves, I think is a step in the right direction. But um, I think it's up to our, uh, our staff member, Stephen Lamb, to, uh, he, he's the man that's been tasked with navigating those those uh, those rapids. So, yeah, kia ora. Yeah, yeah, Mr Chair, if I may just comment about that. Um, I think, um, Chris, your comment that, you know, you'll, you'll gently, gently take it as it comes. There'll come a point in time where, where, where this has got to be broken through because obviously it's holding up a number of the operational things that need to be done. Um, but So I guess uh, just uh, watch the space, really, uh, how you might navigate that and whatever support, I guess, we as constituency members can give you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I guess the guidance I give to my managers here is that we need to assess what the risk to life and property is from not doing anything. Right. And in this case, it's not uh, judged to be serious. We just don't know what's coming, of course, in terms of storm events. But um, the worst that would happen, I believe, is just localised erosion. And um, the consequences of that will, will fall on, on those local people anyway. So, uh, yeah, we're happy just to let things lie for now. Of course, some of that localised erosion is an issue to the land trusts yes. who own that land. Um, <laughs> and they are actually the major rate payers within that area. Uh, so that, 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 that's an issue that they bring to the table and, and we just have to navigate that. Kia ora. Thank you. Okay, there's a resolution on page 181. We received the report for the Environmental Code of Practice. Sorry, Thank you, Councillor Thurston, seconded by Councillor Crosby. Any further discussion? I'll put that resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. Against carried. Moving on to sea lettuce and whitebait. Who's doing this one? I don't see uh, Josie or Alistair. Oh, they, no, Josie. Hello, welcome. We had somebody zooming in too. Are they there? Oh. 
What a stroke of luck. <laughs> yep, Rob Donald and Alistair. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Are we yeah, we're live. We'll wait for Rob to come in. There he is. Hi, Rob. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me okay? Yep, good as gold. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And um, so we're on to page 190, the environmental publications, sea lettuce and whitebait in the Bay of Plenty. Josie's here in person. So welcome along, team. And uh, who's going to kick off? Rob, your call, I don't mind. Oh, I guess, uh, why don't we kick off with Josie, Mr Chairman? Josie, looks as though it's you. Fantastic. Um, tēnā koutou, councillors. Um, and yeah, today we're just here to give you a bit of an update on sea lettuce research and monitoring in Tauranga Harbour. Um, so the level four lockdown was great. I got a lot of time to work on some back burner projects. And yeah, this one's come up with quite a bit of new content. So um, apologies for the speed we move through this. So I don't need to go over this too much if you guys. Um, we all know that sea lettuce has caused a bit of a problem around um, Te Awanui in the last couple of years, um, dating back to the 1940s of the really big blooms we've had. Um, the large blooms are an issue just due to the effects that they can have on the marine ecosystem. So reducing oxygen conditions, displacing seagrass, reducing the benthic biodiversity of the system. Fish kills in very extreme circumstances, um, increased nutrient releases from the sediment and um, hydrogen sulphide gas release, which can be a risk to human health, um, which I believe you've heard from a few years ago before. <clears throat> so this report was just an update on research up to the start of 2020. So the last report was about 10 years ago. Um, so I thought it was about time to analyse some of the new research we've had. So we'll be talking about um, the results of the bi-monthly monitoring of sea lettuce abundance that's been going since 91. Um, targeted water quality program, which was looking at nutrient conditions coming in and out of the harbour entrance during El Nino and La Nina events. Um, we've got some beach cast sea lettuce results, looking at spatial surveys of sea lettuce isotopes and where nutrient the nutrient content is coming from. And then quite a lot of research that we've commissioned to the University of Waikato um, on the sea lettuce blooms. So firstly, the large blooms of sea lettuce have reduced massively in recent times. Um, so you can see on this graph here, we've got sea lettuce abundance on the left and then coming along, we're going through time. And you can see since um, the early 90s, we had those big blooms, we are getting 100% coverage of sea lettuce across the foreshore. Um, we're now sort of sitting down to 50% when we do get those big bloom events that come through. We see a seasonal um, changes in biomass still, so that summer spring period is still peak season for sea lettuce blooms um, with it reduced off during the cooler months. We did some spatial mapping um, using GIS to have a look at the whole harbour macroalgae coverage. So we've got some, the major hot spots are mostly around the southern harbour, so Otomotai, um, Waikario and Waimapu are some of those big areas. And in the northern harbour, Ongari Point is still quite a, um, an accumulation point. We're also starting to see some of this nuisance red algae, Gracilaria, which is appearing in the northern harbour, which is mostly around Tuapero and Ongari Point. Um, so it's another type of nuisance um, algal species. But this one sort of buries itself into the sediment. So once it's in a place, it tends to stay there rather than moving around like the sea lettuce does. So something we'll be keeping an eye on. Um, it's quite a problem species down south. Um, we've had a look at the seasonal variability of nutrients within the sea lettuce tissues. And what we've found that is that the sea lettuce nutrient content is varying with the estuary and the river water quality. So we've got quite strong relationships between nitrogen concentrations in the estuary water and the river water compared to what's in the sea lettuce tissue itself. However, we don't have the same relationship with phosphorus, which indicates it's getting its phosphorus um, content from somewhere other than the water column. Um, the latest water quality rivers report, which was Hamlet L 2020, did show we have significant increases of nutrients in some rivers in the Southern Harbour. Um, 
which we'll come back to a bit later. We also had a wee look at how um, the climate is driving sea lettuce abundances. So you may remember from the park report that we had quite a strong relationship between the um, Southern Oscillation Index or the El Nino, La Nina years and the blooms of sea lettuce. So those El Nino years are when we tended to get the biggest sea lettuce blooms. Um, that relationship does still remain. Um, there is quite a close coupling of sea lettuce abundances and the climatic cycle. But we have only had one strong El Nino event in recent times, which was sort of the 2014, 2015 period. Um, and, but it, we didn't get those typical strong westerly winds, which is what we associate with those El Nino events. So we didn't quite get the same level of sea lettuce blooms in that year. So here's just a quick graph showing the, um, that on the, up towards the top there, you've got higher sea lettuce abundances occurring in that negative phase of the Southern Oscillation Index, which is those El Nino conditions. So this relationship still stands. It is quite a weak relationship, um, but we'll come back to that again with the university research. <clears throat> um, Another project that we ran was we did five years of water quality sampling on the ingoing and outgoing tide at um, the edge of Mount Monganui to look at whether there was any upwelling of nutrients coming in during El Nino years, which was the one of the predictions we had as to why we were seeing these big blooms of sea lettuce in El Nino years. And what we did find was there was quite clear distinction between the El Nino and the La Nina years in the water quality. So El Nino conditions were a bit colder um, and we did see increased ammonium concentrations coming in on the incoming tides um, compared to the outgoing tides. But this was quite not huge changes in concentrations, but when you consider the volume of water that's coming in and out, um, it could play a significant role in increasing nutrient concentrations in the harbour. Furthermore, we looked a little bit at the sea lettuce tissue isotopes. So this, these isotopes can tell us a bit about where the nitrogen source is coming from for the sea lettuce. And what we found was we've got quite normal condition, quite normal isotope conditions in our sea lettuce for New Zealand. But what we did find is there is a difference between the northern harbour and the southern harbour sea lettuce nitrogen content. So there's potentially slightly different sources in the two different ends of the harbour. Um, the problem with these isotope measurements is unless we can sample these sources of the nitrogen inputs, um, it's quite hard to distinguish exa exactly where it's coming from. So we've got a mix of potential sources, which was sewage, sediment recycling processes and freshwater runoff. The other thing we can identify with the sea lettuce isotopes is upwelling events. So we had um, potential upwelling identified in the sea lettuce tissue content at a number of sites. We had we did took samples um, once or twice a week from a couple of locations in the harbour and we had a big westerly wind event during an El Nino year and we saw a big dip in the isotopic signature. Just Sorry. for the great unwashed nutrient upwelling. Means. So oce oceanic nutrient upwelling. Okay, so you, you step, you. Coming in from the coast, yep. Yeah. Awesome. So we've captured this um, prolonged westerly wind event and we saw that the tissue content in the sea lettuce during that period dropped dramatically, which indicates gives us further evidence that that coastal upwelling is possibly playing a role in fueling some of the sea lettuce growth, which is great to have two lines of evidence um, for this possibly occurring. And then the last bit of info is having a look at the um, subterranean groundwater inputs to the harbour. This was a pH, piece of PhD research commissioned to Waikato Uni, and it's probably the most important piece of information that we've gained towards our knowledge of sea lettuce growth. So they found that the groundwater, the subterranean groundwater inputs to the harbour were substantially higher than rivers and streams. The nitrogen load estimated to be about five times higher than surrounding rivers and streams, and the phosphorus load to be about eight times higher. So 
quite substantial input of nutrients into the harbour. Um, what, what they have noted is that nutrient recycling in the, the marine sediments is likely mixing with the fresh, fresh water, groundwater coming in. So this is going to be a mix of groundwater inputs from both fresh water and nutrient recycling in the sediments. And then the second piece of info he found was during El Nino years, there was lower freshwater runoff. You get the greater westerly winds, and this sets up this situation which creates a longer residence time in the harbour. So you've got those water masses being held in the water for longer, allowing more time for nutrient uptake by the sea lettuce. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. You've got this extra nutrients coming in um, during the El Nino years, and then the water's held there longer for the sea lettuce to be able to uptake it. So summary, um, sea lettuce blooms reduced in recent times. Um, we've got some accumulation hotspots that we monitor regularly, and we do see relationship between the water quality and the sea lettuce tissue nutrients. El Nino years do remain the highest risk for sea lettuce blooms due to the increase of both the nutrient-rich groundwater coming in, potential coastal upwelling events, and then that also brings in cooler water, keeping the temperatures of the harbour at a suitable temperature for longer for sea lettuce growth. So looking forward to what we might see for future blooms, likely going to be a mix of nutrient-rich groundwater coming in combined with the riverine inputs and highlight and suitable temperatures um, that will be required. Climate change, um, we could see a reduction in sea lettuce blooms um, due to increased temperatures. You'll see that this year the sea lettuce sort of tailed off quite earlier due to the high water temperatures. So if we're getting warmer summers, um, that might reduce the period of blooms or potentially move it more towards winter blooms when there's more nutrient runoff and things. Um, it's quite a hard one for us to predict at this stage. But core management option for us is reducing those nutrient inputs and the MPS FM is going to be a, a massive part of, um, of this work. And we do have some modelling underway looking at what nutrient reductions might be required to keep sea lettuce at a lower level. And I think that's it. Um, yeah, that's me. Thank you. For the chair, question on this one. Councillor Clark. Yeah, this entry, subterranean nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus being higher than the, than the ground or the freshwater ones. Got a reason for that? Got any science behind it? Now, I'll start by saying I'm not a groundwater expert and I'm very much um, pulling research from what this Waikato University researcher has done. But the, there was a couple of different, um, there's different flow rates of the groundwater into the harbour. So he was looking at just the southern harbour and looking at sort of short term and longer term turnover of groundwater. So you think about some of this groundwater, it takes a very long time to travel down. Actually, um, it, this could be quite a, I'm quite interested in this, so what I'd prefer is pick this conversation up outside the meeting unless everybody's sort of riveted to it like I am. <laughs> so uh, um, I sure. can really pass that. Was the third is the Thank you. Um, yes, I was on the same theme, actually. Um, I'm aware that um, a lot of our farmers, avocado um, farmers in particular, put a lot of nutrients on their, um, their crops, perhaps more than strictly might be required. So I'm sort of trying to, in my mind, think about the, the um, synergies or the similarities between the Lake Rotorua issue um, with high nutrients and needing to reduce nutrients to improve the quality of the lakes. And the same with Tauranga Harbour. Is that a possibility? Is it like a whole land management issue changing um, our nutrient footprints of our land management might actually impact on the health of the harbour by reducing sea lettuce blooms? Is that, am, I, am I wrong or am I? Yeah, no, yep, definitely. Yeah. That's exactly toward what we're sort of aiming towards and what we're what we've done is we are, we've got a contractor um, working on some nutrient modelling at the moment, which is looking at coupling what's coming off the land with those groundwater estimates, the upwelling estimates, and then our knowledge of how sea lettuce reacts to that. So if we can reduce nutrient inputs, um, 
yeah, we'll be modelling what might be required to. I have to say that when I came on council, this is what the public was telling me, that this is, was one of the contributing factors. And we said, no, a, a deep ocean upwelling on cool currents coming in in El Nino years. And it's sort of like it's actually being proven that local knowledge does have, have some input. Councillor White? Yeah, I suppose I'm on the same vein in some ways. Um, you know, my, my simplistic way of boiling it down is what is the contributor from natural upwelling sources? So deep down, so nature doing what nature does, and then human intervention and what sources are coming from the human side of things. And in the context of that, you can easily control the human side but not the natural side. It's a little bit like geothermal upwelling and its contribution to nitrogen and the sources in the Lake Rotorua and other places versus those that are actually man-made from leaching off farms or the saltation from phosphorus and, uh, you know, deforestation, for example. So really, uh, how, how, how close are you or how far away are you from defining those two limits? I'm hoping that within the next year I'll have a good, really good solid answer on that for you. Um, the modelling work that our um, consultant's doing at the moment is working towards, yeah, telling us exactly that. Um, what are those natural, so the two natural ones, the, the big coastal upwelling, how much volume is that actually putting of nutrients into the harbour and then the natural recycling processes in the sediment, um, how that fits in with then these inputs that we have introduced to the harbour. Thank you. Uh, Norm? Thank you. Um, yeah, we know what nitrogen does, but I'm interested in um, the phosphorus. We've linked that, um, well, we largely link that to sediment. Um, and you know, there's been quite a program on the land to reduce sediment, sediment from subdivision workings um, and on farm with fencing of streams. Are we getting any indication from that as to what it's, if is it having an, an effect? And I know you've got the sediment that's already sitting in the harbour that's probably still got all that attached to it. That's exactly it. I, that's, we haven't looked too much into it, but that's exactly what we guess. That, that's where that phosphorus requirement is coming from for the sea lettuce. Um, the phosphorus isn't a huge requirement. Nitrogen is the driving factor for sea lettuce growth, but it does need some balance of phosphorus, and I think that it's probably getting more than enough of that from the sediments that are already in the harbour. Thank you. Um, Rob and Alistair, did you want to add to the discussion? Where have you gone? Uh, I'm still here. <laughs> um, yeah. I guess the only thing I'd add, Mr Chairman, is that this work will obviously continue. Um, so now we've got 30 years of research and monitoring under our belts, and we're learning something new just about every time we commission a new piece of research or look at the monitoring data. So it really shows how complex this issue is, but it feels like we're getting on top of the key causes of the problem. But again, it's looking like it's coming back to what happens on the land is the key driving factor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and for this sensitive environment, that's obviously something that we'll have to consider under the implementation of the NPS. Okay, Councillor MacDonald. Question then, given the research, is this then a, an imminent result that we would expect to see when we're looking at the urban growth of Tauranga Moana? will exacerbate. Even land management is a player in what causes the exacerbation of this. It's a tricky one, but I think, yes, with the, yeah, unless we can manage what's going in, and I guess up until now, we probably haven't had very strong links or knowledge around what all of those nutrient inputs were to the harbour and if sea lettuce was uptaking it. So now we've got quite a good understanding of what those sources could be and now we can do the job of managing it. Okay, thank you. So one more question then to all of us around the table. What then? 
what then do we do about it if we already know what is expected to be an outcome of where we're heading in urban development in Tauranga Moana? Councillor Nees. Just an, another question. Um, we heard this morning uh, from Balance that they are, are treating their stormwater um, uh, by making it pH neutral before they release it into the uh, harbour. Um, but I'm not clear whether that still means it's got high concentrations of nitrogen or phosphorus when it actually goes into the harbour. I'm just reminded of the public concerns a number of years ago that balance was actually an exacerbating factor and our research around the um, deep water upwelling was taken as, well, yes, no, it's not a contributing factor. Can you say from the isotope monitoring that those sources from a manufacturing plant aren't a contributing factor? From the survey that we did, no, but yes, um, isotopes in particular with sea lettuce have been used to trace pollute, point source pollutants. Yeah, in the, in the past. So yeah, that's something that it could be used as a tool to find to identify out. that. Yeah. Might be a question we throw back to balance, um, Sarah, in terms of their monitoring. That question exactly, Councillor Nees. out of their stormwater discharge, don't know. He said it's pH balance, yep, but, um, and I know they keep it on site for a long time and, it, and the solids suspend into a tank and then they scrape it out and reuse it, dry it, reuse it, but um, you don't know what's in solution. Maybe that's a question, Sarah, we can go back to Sean or um, Dominic probably. Any further questions for Josie? Thank you, Josie, for your uh, there's lots of synergies. I have to say, there's lots of synergies between Rotorua Lakes and the sea lettuce in Tauranga Harbour. It's land management catchments that we've got to do to better capture nitrogen and phosphate. The the yeah, I'm just thinking we're not reinventing the wheel here in Tauranga, but boy, there's lots of synergies. Because the sediment in the lakes contains a, a lot of uh, phosphate. When the lake stratifies, zero oxygen, up it comes blue-green algae, like no tomorrow. And I'm thinking, is that, is that the cause of sea lettuce, the sediments off the harbour bottom that have been trapped there for years and there's certain conditions occur and she's just lettuce for Africa. And the same in the Ohiwa Harbour with sea stars. Ah. Sea stars? Stars, sea, sea stars. Sea stars, starfish. Starfish. I call them sea stars. Okay. Okay. Um, Alistair, did you have anything to add to the discussion? Um, anything we've missed? But No, not really. Um, just one minor point I guess I would make, and that is that urbanisation is responsible for lots of degradation to water quality, but it's not usually associated with increased nutrient inputs. Yeah. It's mainly the heavy metals and during construction, the sedimentation. There's not a lot of nutrients coming out from urban development. Yeah, again, because I'm Rotary Lakes, I'm familiar with, urbanisation is seen as a good thing because you're taking intensive land agricultural use, you're putting it into an urbanisation that's got sewerage connected and it's a minimum nutrient loss from urbanisation. But um, it's probably the best thing that can happen to intensive agricultural land from a environmental point of view, but we're losing um, you know, high productivity soils to um, put houses on. Anyway, white bait. Gotta love these ones. I'll just share my screen with you. So, can everyone see that PowerPoint? No, not yet. Sorry. Two. Are 
Are you sharing your screen, Alistair? Oh, sorry, I've got a... Oh, God. Mr Chairman, before he um, yep. comes online, just a question, Sarah, and you might have to get back to us, but the management of the stormwater um, channels from all of Tauranga's stormwater ponds, I'm thinking Carmichael Reserve, where we've got flushing gates, who manages those stormwater you know, flushing gates? Yeah, that's Tauranga City Council have their comprehensive stormwater consent and they take um, they take samples, I think it's sometimes daily, monthly, We've got a very comprehensive monitoring program in place which they report back to their own council every five years and to the regional council so we get all of their data. Uh, you would have, through the Tauranga Moana Advisory Group, um, received their five-year um, comprehensive stormwater monitoring report, um, which was about this, and it looks in detail at um, a number of contaminants, it looks at um, fish numbers, it's a very comprehensive report. We, in terms of um, some of those smaller consents that um, may be separate to the the comprehensive network, we also receive all of that monitoring information. So we can look at um, what it is that we're getting from balance and see at the discharge point um, what levels of nutrients are in there, and we can come back to you on that. Alistair, white bait. Presentation, can you know? Yep, yep. For everybody. I'm just going to run through some work I've done over the past couple of years. I uh, just want to acknowledge the input of Julian Sykes. He's a, a NEWA scientist down in Christchurch, and he's done a lot of this modelling work for GIS in both Auckland and Canterbury. So I thought I'd use his expertise to help me with some of this work as well. So I'll just start by saying that we all know that white bait and the activity of white baiting are hugely important, both culturally and recreationally, recreationally throughout New Zealand. And although whitebait is made up of five species of galaxids, the majority are inunga, which is the Galaxius maculatus. And there's growing concern about their conservation status. In fact, it's got a conservation status of at risk in decline, which is a bit of a worry for such a popular iconic species. A couple of things about whitebait in terms of where they spawn. Um, they spawn at what we call the upper limit of the salt wedge in lowland waters. And so the salt wedge is where the saline water comes in at high tide and it will push its way as far inland as it can before the flow of the freshwater river is pushing it back. So this location varies, it's almost like a dance between your high tide and your river flow. So the more flow there is in the river that's going to push that high tide back and the less flow the tide's going to creep up a lot further inland. So it's basically a, a, a very ill-defined zone wherever the, the salt wedge is. Now, the other thing about inunga is they spawn amongst um, vegetation which is submerged at the high tide. So therefore, any activities that submerge this vegetation are going to be detrimental to whitebait spawning. So really, uh, if we're going to try and look after inunga as a species, we really have to try and protect their spawning sites um, because you know, the females are highly fecund, they produce lots of eggs, and if they can't lay anywhere, we're going to be losing. So spawning habitat is easily destroyed. Um, we have lots of riprap going in, unfortunately, in areas where spawning is known to occur. We've got lots of grass, which is either mown or sprayed with glyphosate. And so again, that's very poor spawning habitat here. And then stock grazing also will um, you know, eat grass down to a very low level. And more importantly, stock will also trample over grass and potentially trample over eggs within um, grass, which had been submerged at the previous high tide. So as with most councils, um, our regional natural resources plan has got lots of words and policies written to protect spawning sites. So just a few of these objectives here. We talk about spawning sites are gonna be maintained and enhanced. We talk about we're gonna exclude stock from the beds of streams. And we mentioned spawning values for indigenous fish um, and trout. So we kind of say all these words We've got this beast called Scheduled 1C, which is um, a list of all known whitebait spawning sites. So if you look at this, there are 18 rivers in Scheduled 1C. This is just an example here. And there's 23 locations. But I, I just want to emphasize that these are point grid references. So they only represent points of known spawning, not a zone. They're also only in a few rivers. There's only been 18 rivers identified in Scheduled 1C. 
And also none of these rules up here really consider the temporal component, the fact that, okay, we might need to protect them, but they, it's quite silent on the length of time that we need to protect them for. Is it one month or two months or five months, for example? So based on all that, I thought I'd, I'd do some work to try and identify where potential white bait spawning zones are to quantify the habitat conditions within these spawning zones and then to develop a GIS-based model to predict spawning zones. Because I did this because we can't obviously survey every waterway within the region. We have to go and do modeling work as well. And then lastly, I was just interested to see just how much potential spawning habitat we've lost through agricultural activities and activities associated with land drainage. So hopefully all of this work is hopefully gonna lead into better rules and protection in our plans, which we're currently revising as part of the NPS process. So I'll quickly zip through these um, four separate studies. If we look at the salt wedge survey, um, I managed to get a boat up 19 waterways. And I did this work at what we call the mean high water springs, which is the, the highest tide. And I did this February to May in 2017 and 2018. And I made sure I did at least two surveys in each river just to make sure I was getting some idea of that natural variability of where that salt wedge is. As I said, I used a boat to go and I used this amazing device called, called a Castaway CTD, Conductivity Temperature Depth Logger, which is a sort of wee device here. And you basically throw it overboard and as it drops down into the bottom of the stream, it measures conductivity, temperature and depth. And so you get these lovely profiles as to where the salt wedge is. And this is just an example in the Wairoa River. And the blue dots here are all fresh water. You can see I'm doing the dots across the river. And the yellow and green dots are more saline water. And where the two meet just here is your salt wedge. So oh, yeah. on that day in that river, that's where that tongue of salt water was penetrating here, just in the mid part of the channel. So the actual wedge is sort of in that area on this particular day. So I, as I said, I did this in 19 rivers and basically we went as far west as Caddy Caddy and as far east as Apodiki. Red lines mark the area of the zones. You might notice that there are some blue lines here um, below the red lines and that's just areas of very salty water which is well outside the salt water wedge because it's too saline. The median length of all these so zones is about a kilometre and the shortest um, was in the Kaikokapu Canal around the Makatu area and that was only 110 metres and that reflects the fact that that channel was very U-shaped in profile and it was just like this solid wall of water pushing against the tide. The longest was in the Whakatania River up to five kilometres. So again you get varying lengths of these zones. So I just want to emphasise again that the the spatial variability of these zones is largely dependent upon the flow of the river. So here we have the Rangitaki in the upper image and the Whakatani below in the lower image. The flows here, which I measured, were the 94th percentile, so that represents a very high flow. So in other words, 94% of the flows are lower than that. And then Stephen Park did this work as part of some trust power hydro consenting investigations where the flow was in the 10th percentile. So that's the, the, the sort of theoretical zone of the, of the salt wedge. So the salt can penetrate up to here at the 10th percentile flow. And likewise in the Whakatania River, 93rd percentile, it's the landing road bridge. And here it's at the 38th percentile. And we also know that at times when the river's down to about the 10th percentile of flow, it's up there where the water treatment plant is. So that just emphasizes again that we don't deal with a single point of spawning, which is implied by scheduled 1C, but we have this zone. So the second thing was once I worked out where the potential spawning area was, I wanted to see uh, what the habitat um, spawning was like, or sorry, the habitat for spawning. Rather than reinvent the wheel, methodology developed by a non-governmental organization called the White Bait Connection. And they basically score 12 habitat parameters, which are known to affect spawning. Things like access to the sea, fish passage, type of vegetation, bank stability, bank vegetation, um, various things like that. And for each of those parameters, you either give it a score, a score of zero, five or 10, and you sum these up to give a total of 125. I actually modified one of the scores to, so I had zero, five and 15. Um, in terms of what we found, these are the 19 sites here. Uh, remember we can go from zero to 120. So sites down here, we've got, you know, about 70, uh, which is quite a low score. And some of the highest are about 90. So that's kind of like saying it's like 
two thirds of the habitat conditions are quite good, but we're not certainly up in the 120s. For all these habitat factors, so fish access, saltwater access, bank material and vegetation type were good at 75% of the sites, but um, bank angle and more importantly, vegetation height scored poorly. And I just emphasize vegetation height because that emphasizes how much vegetation was either mown or sprayed in these sites which we sampled. And so that's obviously quite poor from a spawning point of view. Onto the GIS work, um, as I said earlier, I've just done 19 waterways. It's impossible to do the whole region unless you had a, a lot of time on your hands. And I don't think it's particularly cost effective to do that. So this is where we can do some modeling work. So what we do is we just developed a simple digital terrain model, which we got from our LIDAR surveys, which gives us elevations um, of the river mouth areas. We then got some tide information describing the mean high water springs, and we used the upper 90th percentile of all tides in the region using that datum, um, the Motoriki Springs datum. So that became our contour, the mean high water springs contour was simply overlying on the LIDAR model. And we drew that line, and there's a few things that Julian did, but we then developed the saltwood zones uh, for the other sites. And then we just tested the validity of the models using the actual measured um, results in those 19 waterways as well. So I identified 92 streams that drained to the sea with its saltwater um, zones, saltwood zones, and that's many more than scheduled 1C, obviously. And I've put this into RGIS, uh, which hopefully this might become the new planning tool in the rewrite of the RNRP. So this is what it looks like. Um, that's just the map of the entire region. And when we zoom in, you can see these are the potential spawning salt wedge zones oh. in the, that's the um, Tarawera, Rangitaki, Fakatani rivers. And that's the, um, the um, Kopiriroa and the Waiari stream. So you can, you know, the idea is we can zoom in and have a look with these as we go. The red marking is purely indicating those waterways which are inside the coastal marine area. I just thought it'd be quite useful to highlight that because that's got a different set of planning rules to it than the freshwater layer. Um, the next thing I was just interested in doing was just asking the question, well, just how much potential spawning habitat has been lost as a, as a result of land drainage and land use change? So I did this by three different methods. I first looked at historical aerial imagery to assess the length of rivers which have been lost due to channel straightening. I then quantified the loss of wetlands uh, and I used uh, some modeling work that DOC have done. And I just looked at how much waterways and catchment areas above known tide gates or pump stations have we potentially lost because Inunga can't migrate above these structures. So if you look at the first one, changes to river length, and I'm just going to talk about the uh, Kaituna and Fakatania rivers. The blue line is the current channel, and the red line is where the rivers used to flow in both the Kaituna and the Fakatani. And you can see that we've lost about 30% of the length um, of these lowland rivers have been lost due to um, the river straightening activities. So that's just like one of the unintended effects you have when you try and maximize your drainage efficiencies, you lose these meanders and you lose potential spawning habitat. Loss of wetland area. Um, DOC have got these models of historic wetlands, and these are overlaid here in the Tarawera, Rangitaki, Fakatani plain area. So that's the, the modeled wetland, that stippling effect. And these are the current wetlands here, just these pinky areas. So within the, um, these three basically catchments, Tarawera, Rangitaki, and Fakatani, We've got you know, less than 5% in the Tarawera and a very low amount of lowland wetlands left in the Rangitaki and Fakatani. And indeed in the entire region, we've only got 2.7% of our lowland wetlands left. And that's a, a similar story throughout New Zealand, unfortunately, just reflecting the fact that these wetlands are found in these highly productive areas, which were converted for agricultural you know, 100 years ago. I then just wanted to quantify how much waterways are above these control structures. So I identified where the gates and pump stations are. And I looked at um, the catchment area and waterway length above these, but I just restricted this to uh, low elevation, less than 15 meters, because that's where the salt wedge will be. And that just gives us an idea of how much spawning habitat we've lost. And again, this is just the, uh, the Rangitaki Plains. So you've got the Tarawera, Arini Complex, Kopi Canal and uh, the Fakatani area here. And we've got approximately 20,000 hectares of land, which these areas cover above tide gates and pump stations and about 300 kilometers of waterway length. 
So that's a lot of potential habitat which is unavailable. Now, a lot of it's not spawning habitat because my spawning saltwood survey is down here, but the rest of this is potential habitat for Enunga if the habitat condition was good and the water quality was good. So, I mean, we could get quite good wins on the board um, by modifying pump stations and tide gates. And I know that the rivers and drainage team are doing a lot of that good work by doing retrofitting tide gates. So I just want to end by another success story that rivers and drainage are doing. Um, this article was written oh, yep. in the Daily Inquirer. It's been published in you know, the, uh, the Beacon, just about the work uh, that they've done creating these um, Inunga ponds in the Whakatane River. I went out there about a month ago, I think, with Erin Brocker, our graduate scientist, and we're just schools of white bait in these. So yeah, it's a really fantastic thumbs up to the rivers and drainage team for doing this. And I think this sort of work, I think, is a really nice way of basically being able to have your wide stocked bank rivers where you've got these floodplains, rather than just have them for cows to graze on, we can actually build these structures, structures and give really important biodiversity benefits. So I think this is you know, a really um, neat um, initiative they're doing. They've got them in the Tarawera and they've got them in the Kaituna. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to working with that team to help sort of monitor the effectiveness of more of that work. So with that, I'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Alistair. Um, question from me. You had Kaituna down at 90 for that on that um, scale. So was that pre-diversion work and now that the diversion is up and running successfully, you would expect the Kaituna there to be a lot better? No, not really. The um, Where the diversion work was done, that's actually far too saline for whitebait spawning. So the salt wedge is actually further up there. Oh, okay. Oh. This really reflects the type of vegetation along the, the river there and the banks are very steep. So the vegetation, a lot of it's quite scruffy um, shrubs and trees, and there's not much of that um, dense ground cover underneath which you know you need to spawn with. Okay, thank you. Questions? No, no questions. Councillor Eti. Oh, kia ora, Chair. I'd just like to mihi to Alistair and to Chris and the team for the incredible work that they've done uh, in the white bait restoration. It's been an ongoing issue um, and to to uh, have a solution that is actively being rolled out, fantastic. Thank you. Kia ora. Yeah, totally. Okay. Right, the resolution that we receive, Shari, that we receive the reports, there's no, um, there's no um, resolutions, no. Would somebody like to move to re receive the report on sea lettuce and white bait? Councillor uh, Brunning, seconded by Councillor Eating. Is there any further discussion? All those in favour, please say aye. Against, carried. Moving on to um, publicly excluded, but before we go that, we just need to say that um, this concludes the public section of this meeting, and the meeting will now move into public excluded purely to receive the minutes of the previous meeting. So the